fans are on hand to watch a great renewal of a rivalry that dates back to the late 1800s, Utah and BYU. This is the first possession of the ball game now for Utah. They have the ball. BYU's quarterback, Sarkeesian, was picked off just moments ago. And so now, on a second down situation, Rocky Henry on the receiving end of the pass, but Mike Fouts gets out close to the 20-yard line. I'm Gary Gerald, along with John Spagnola. Great to have you with us. Hope you enjoyed the lead-in on our doubleheader on this day and quite a battle going on at Happy Valley. This is Mike Bouts, the quarterback for the University of Utah, a junior college transfer who's thrown for 16 touchdown passes in this his initial season for the Utes. And he came in in the third game of the year as a starter. He's 6-2 as a starter. He's done an outstanding job leading this football team. Third down. And a follow on the big bruising running back gets the first down and more out close to the 30-yard line. And what a story this young man is. 274 pounds. You see him pictured here. He is a freshman, and he has been sensational in the last couple of ball games for Utah as we check out the Chili's Grill and Bar opening lineups. Kevin Dyson, Rocky Henry, Rick Tucker joining him. And the receiving four and running back four. First down for Fouts to go to work at the 30 yard line. Uh oh, follow. Oh, the contact as he gets out close to another first down at the 39 yard line. That is a tremendous challenge for a defensive crew spag to try to derail that runaway locomotive and, and eddie sampson the free safety came up and tried to send a message yeah you can break through the line mafala but i'm gonna hit you he's running behind a great offensive line and they do a lot of zone blocking chris ray who is the defensive tackle or as the tackle on that side anchoring the line but this is one thing you don't want to see today and that's the cougar secondary having to tackle mafala when he breaks through the line of scrimmage. Didn't quite get the first down, just inches short, close to the 40-yard line. Now throwing, finds his man Kevin Dyson, gets close to the 46-yard line before he's snagged by Eddie Sampson. So after BYU had taken the opening kickoff and moved across midfield, they were intercepted. This is Utah's first possession. We take a look at the Chili's lineup here of the BYU defensive line and the backers. John Ross, a twin brother to Stan Ross, both of them on that defensive line, identical twins. They are the key men. And then in the backfield, Jamie Cook, solid, rock-hard hitter. A lot more defensive intensity from the Cougars this year than from Lavelle Edwards' squads in the past. Juan Johnson, the running back, getting just short of midfield on that carry, trying the left side of the line. You know, you raise a good point there, Gary, and that is, in speaking to Lavelle Edwards, he said, this is the hardest-hitting secondary that he has had in all his years at BYU. The defense really gets after people. They lay people out every game, and it all started with Tim McTire, the cornerback, but the secondary is not afraid to get after people, and you know, a couple of players every game seem to be wobbling off to the sidelines as a result of some big hitting. But again, that front seven has got to stop the big guy today on the running play. Second down situation. Busk in motion. Malapala, he's got room. Head down, hammers through one defender. Takes three others to pull him down as he's now into BYU territory. Jamie Cook and Eddie Sampson coming up from the secondary. The safety's making the tackle. That is what I mean. You just have a single back. Linemen come off, zone blocking. If there's a little hole, he's going to take it through there. Good block on the right side by Chris Ray, number 66. Now, he has the ability, though, out of this set to cut it back. Basically, they want to get a push all over the place. And there's a look at that young man, freshman, 274 pounds. And I think a lot of that weight just has to depend on what he eats for breakfast that day. It can go anywhere from 265 to 275. <laughs> but think about this. If you put pads on him and your pads, your helmet, everything else weighs another 15 pounds, and you've got maybe a 285, 295 runaway freight train coming at you. You know, I would scary. not want to be in the secondary today, Gary. The scary part about the fact of his family is that he's the smallest member of his family. <laughs> now, think about that. And I think there are seven brothers and sisters in that family. And at 274, he, he's the baby. A true freshman. Boy, I'd love to look at that grocery bill, wouldn't you, when they get together? 
just over nine minutes to go in the opening quarter on an absolutely picture-perfect afternoon at the foot of the Wasatch Mountains in Provo, Utah. Bob Hamilton now in the backfield. He's the lone setback. Out firing out here, but well overthrows Rocky Henry, the intended receiver, on the near side. Utah comes into this one having won its last three games. They beat Air Force, Utah State, and Wyoming. They've had the luxury spags of having a week off with the bye, and they said it couldn't have come at a better time. A lot of guys nicked up and injured, getting a chance to heal, and of course, you don't have to talk about motivating people for this uh, rivalry. No, they played 10 weeks in a row, and Ron McBride told me this was a great week to have a week off. People got healthy, they got to spend some extra time on the BYU offense and defensive scheme. Ron Johnson, well, one of the interior linemen for the Cougars, <laughs> lost his helmet. That was Matt Redden. Helmet went flying down there. He snatches it back. You know, it shows you what the rivalry is all about, too, doesn't it? I mean, here he is without a helmet. He's still mixing it up, throwing forearms around, punching people. You just tend to forget everything that's going on around you. Defensive signals being relayed in now to BYU. I think that was Tom Ramage, the defensive line coach. And let's see Reddit's helmet come off. Oh. <laughs> oh, he gets an arm under the face mask from Rick Tucker, number 84. And that got him a little upset. Five receivers now in a third down situation. Three split to the left, two to the right. Fouts has time. Got all kinds of time. Now floats it out. Oh, a one-hand snag made by Henry Lusk. Terrific catch out there. And Henry Lusk, who's a great athlete, managed to pull that one out. He's from California, the MVP of the 1993 Freedom Bowl, and he came up with a big play right there for the first down. Well, he sure did, and he's a guy that they asked him to do too much earlier this year. He uh, plays tight end, he plays slot position, and he'll play running back, wide receiver. But his versatility is a big key to why this Utah offense can move the ball so effectively. Just joining us, scoreless here, about midway through the opening quarter in Provo. Utah in the red and white with the ball. They've advanced to BYU's 31-yard line. Terrific protection. Throwing deep but overthrowing Rocky Henry. Bouts having all kinds of time to throw. Protection has not been a problem. It was only a two-man two pattern. I, I think the Utes were expecting a blitz there. See how they keep everybody in? Both tight ends are in, a play-action fake. Now, there's only a two-man pattern. The two wide receivers are in the pattern. The Cougars are playing zone defense, and there's just no way you're going to get anybody open when you're running against uh, so many people who are dropping like that. Dermell Reed was back there defending. We had not expected to see a lot of him today because of a possible injury situation. We understand that Malafala has had a jersey change. The pass, however, to Dyson out here has stopped for no gain, and a nice play by Brad Martin, the weak side linebacker, who comes up and makes the tackle. I'll tell you, one of the staples of this Utah offense is their quick screens, whether it's middle screens in the middle or quick screens outside. There's a look at Mafala now. He's wearing number 14. I guess his jersey got ripped, number six. I think he grew out of the last one. <laughs> yeah, but McTire drove on that football and almost picked off that quick screen. So these guys are ready. They've done their scouting, and they know the tendencies of this offense here. And right now, the last two plays, the Cougars have done the right thing. They didn't blitz when Utah expected them to, and then they were all over that quick screen. Third down and 12. The ball is now at the 33-yard line. Scoreless in the opening quarter. You see the time remaining. Temperature near 60 degrees today. How many times in the past has this great rivalry been played in freezing or snowy conditions? It could not be better today. Five receivers. And Fouts has no place to go. He's caught behind the line of scrimmage. Shea Muirbrook coming up with a great tackle. And the BYU defense has really dug in in this series. And you spread out that defense by formation. Of course, the only vulnerable area is the quarterback draw. There's no other person who can run the football. Watch 46 Muirbrook as he works his way off the blocks. They tried some crisscross blocks up front. He saw the play and made the tackle. So a good stand here by the Cougars. First punting situation of this ball game. Daniel Pulsifer will be standing back at the 49-yard line, and James Dye 
who is one of the best punt return men in the country at the 10. Pulsiver will try to kick it away from him toward the sideline. This one goes into the end zone for the touchback. They'll bring it out to the 20-yard line. So both teams have had their hands on the football one time. Neither one has been able to dent the scoreboard thus far. That's pretty standard fare here at BYU. BYU averages 27 and a fraction points per game, and Sarkeesian figures mightily in those numbers. Looking to throw and completing the ball. At the 35-yard line, Mike e. Mealy, I'm sorry, Attila Mealy making the catch out at the 35. Palaveo coming up from a weak side linebacking position to make the tackle. As we check out the Chili's backs and receiving core to compliment Sarkeesian, Mike Johnston we see pictured here as the leading receiver in terms of catches, 32 coming in on the year into this ball game. Also five touchdown passes to his credit. Out at the 35-yard line, first down now for the Cougars. Sarkeesian with time. Again, completing for another first down. Keiko McGuire on the receiving end of that one, working against Cal Beck. Checking out the offensive line now for BYU. Morris Unitoa, he anchors this very effective line. And Bill Edwards somewhat lavish in his praise about the way this unit has come together as this season has unfolded. And Unitoa, as with most centers, makes the line calls, makes sure people know who they're blocking. And he can get after it in the running game. From their own 46, first down, Cougars. Sarkeesian steps up and now has to take a knee as he goes down after picking up maybe two yards. Fa'omoi was coming up there and putting some pressure on him, so the quarterback slide. Check the defensive alignment now for Utah. Chad Kahaha who is the defensive end, outstanding ball player, leading sacker, was a, formerly a linebacker before he was converted to a down lineman, and he has done a very impressive job for the uh, Utes, also their defensive backs. You're looking at Harold Lusk. Five interceptions coming into this ball game. a former quarterback and a terrific athlete. And he got one interception today, and that's what got Utah their first possession. Just before we came on the air following the Michigan Penn State game down the sideline, but out of bounds, making the catch was Amuli out of the backfield, but you could see as he was striding down there that he had stepped out of bounds, even from our vantage point on the far side of the field. And I think Amuli lost his uh, perception of where he was on the football field. He was running downfield, and he drifted outside, and the quarterback, of course, doesn't know where he is and led him outside. Let's see if we can pick this up if he's... Yeah, see how he starts to drift outside? Now, of course, the ball may take him there but he's a lot better off trying to catch that over his outside shoulder really that's on Sarkeesian he threw the ball out of bounds and Mooley was in position to make the play and actually was in position to make a big play third down from the 48 they need eight yards to keep the drive alive incomplete overthrowing the intended reliever Mike Johnston on the near sideline so the punting unit will come onto the field for BYU, their second possession. The first one ended in an interception. This one gets close to midfield and then stalls and will now be forced to kick for the first time. Alan Boardman is the punter. You see his average this year, 41 and a half yards with a long of 55. Not much wind at all here at Cougar Stadium today. Just a magnificent afternoon. and goes out of bounds inside the 15-yard line. Henry Lusk had an idea to put a hand on it and then step back. So we'll have a change of possession and Utah will come back with the football. The beautiful Wasatch Mountain Range outside Provo. Sports brought to you today by Pontiac and your local Pontiac dealer. We are driving excitement. United Airlines and its 55,000 employee owners come fly our friendly sky. Old Spice Soothing Gel. It takes the heat out of shaving. And now you've got proof. And Beechwood Age Budweiser, the king of beers. This Bud's for you.
Utah will have the football starting at their own 15-yard line. Scoreless thus far, you see, just under four minutes to play in the opening quarter. Second possession now for the Utes. At stake, a possible postseason bowl bid. Kalafawa losing his way out across the 20 to the 23-yard line. Eddie Sampson once again coming up out of the secondary to make the tackle. Alafala working on his second jersey of the day, but it hasn't slowed him down at all as he went lumbering off that left side. Ball out at the 22-yard line where it'll be second down now. I tell you, Sampson's done a nice job filling from the free safety position. You got to watch. He might be vulnerable to a play-action fake, though, because he's coming up quickly and filling. Virginia Tech getting the win over Virginia in that rivalry today. Here's Malafala trying the opposite side. Is he stopped? Indeed, he is behind the line of scrimmage. Well, let's check in with John Saunders, who's standing by in our studios in New York for this update. John? All right, Gary, we have some tennis news for you right here in New York. The WTA Tour Championship. The final will be Steffi Graf, the number one seed against Anka Huber, both winners today. You can see that at 1 o'clock Eastern time tomorrow right here on ABC. Gary, back to you. And back in Pro Bowl, thank you, John, at the 22-yard line after the loss. It's now third down. About three yards to go for the first down. Bounce dancing out of the pocket, being chased. Fires upfield. Complete on the sideline, and the catch is good at the 48-yard line by Henry Lusk. Boy, he did a nice job there. He looked down, looked back, got his hands on the ball. Spags is a former receiver. You know all about those kinds of moves. Yeah, 27-yard reception by Henry Lusk. And you have to wonder how he got so open out there. It seemed like there was a blown coverage. Once Fouts was able to escape outside, well, Val Edwards must be concerned about the fact that uh, there was a defensive breakdown. Not something that's been happening recently for the Cougars. They've been playing really sound defense. Interesting that Lust frequently lines up as a tight end. They use him sometimes in the backfield. Sometimes they'll split him. Right now, he's lined up on the left side of the line. Passing action again. Rocky Henry trying to stay on his feet. He eludes two tacklers. He gets down to the 43-yard line. Jamil Reed had the hit over there. Henry did a nice job of turning a, a short gain into a nice game. I'll tell you what, that's terrific balance by Rocky Henry. I mean, he got rocked here. Look at a hit he takes up there and somehow is able to keep his balance. Shea Muirbrook came over and hit him and somehow he escaped the grasp of the middle linebacker on that solid hit and was able to get it almost, almost to the first down marker. Solid numbers for Rocky Henry through the course of this 1995 collegiate football season. Second down, just need a couple of feet here for the first down. Out going long. Bumped out of bounds was Kevin Dyson. Had no chance to pull that one in. Tim McTire was down there providing the defensive coverage. Well, next Saturday at 10 Mountain Time on ABC's College Football. Most of you will see Ohio State take on their arch rival Michigan in another great traditional Big Ten battle. Or it'll be Florida State tackling Florida. And then at 1.30, we begin coverage of golf's most entertaining event as defending champ Tom Watson joins Fred Couples, Corey Pavin, and Peter Jacobson, and they play the Skins game all next Saturday right here on ABC Sports. Third down and short, less than a yard. At the 43, here's Malafala, and this time he falls forward. He may have the first down. It looked like they had him stopped, but 274 pounds against Jamie Cook. He may have been able to fall forward and get it. It's going to be very close. If Jamie Cook has to keep coming up and make tackles like this all day long, he's going to be worn out by the end of this game. Jamie but Cook is going to be 5'6 by the time we get to the fourth <laughs> quarter instead of the six feet that he's listed right now. But I, I think what's so impressive is the agility of Mafala. I mean, he got in there, he got hit by two people, and he had the strength and agility to be able to shake off the tackles. Here's the quick stick. We don't have chains being used in this game. It's what they call a quick stick. And this is my first time to see one of these bags, and it's a little bit of a different uh, piece of mechanics now when the crew comes in from the sidelines for the measurement. What happened? What happened? Tell me what happened. I'm still wanting to know. <laughs> they they, they wind the clock and they say first down. Thank you. 
I was watching the stick. I wasn't watching the official. I didn't know if it was a first down or not. I want to count links at chain. Come yeah, on. That's I, right. We're old timers. <laughs> we don't use PCs. We don't know how to handle this thing either. All right. We're trying to figure it out, though. The whistle here as the play unfolded. Mahafala grinding ahead close to the 36-yard line. Maybe I'm hearing things. Maybe that wasn't a whistle because it looks like the play will stand. First quarter winding down. We have only 30 seconds to play. Ron McBride pacing the sidelines down below us. The head coach for Utah in his sixth year with the Utes at age 56. He's trying to do something that uh, a Utah team hasn't done for a long time. They want a piece or an outright share of the WAC championship, and that hasn't been done since 1964. 31 years. Second down. Inside handoff, big hole, model follow. Boom, down to the 26-yard line. Got a good lead block from his fullback, Rob Hamilton. There's a flag on the play. A referee today, Jack Baker. He'll sort things out and pass along the information to us. Well, you know, these guys are delighted to be in shirt sleeves today. And this one will work against the Utes. Lavelle Edwards with arms folded, got himself a brand new contract just a couple of days ago. Age 65. Boy, he has been. He Illegal is. shift on the offense. Five yard penalty. Repeat second down. We'll have an untimed down. Untimed down. Second down. Jack Baker giving us the word. Sounds like Jack needs a bottle of water down there. That voice is a little raspy yeah. here early in this one. This? The untimed down is that there's no time left on the clock, but because of the illegal shift, it really is, uh, they should have blown the play dead. Uh, so they're going to run more, one more play here, even though it is the end of the quarter. And now they end it. Well, let's see. We have a timeout taken here. Timeout is that the official? BYU. That's their first timeout. So it's not yet officially the end of the first quarter, I gather. First timeout taken by BYU, and they will talk things over here with a second down situation coming up. So we'll take the break as well from Cougar Stadium in Provo. It's still scoreless. Cast crew on the sidelines today. Let's check in for the first time with Holly Rowe. Holly? Gentlemen, Chris Maafala is now wearing number 14. The reason? His jersey is split up both seams. BYU is trying to tackle him by the jersey. They rip the jersey right off his back. I get the feeling they're going to have to do more than take the shirt off his back to stop this fullback today. Back up to you, Gary. <laughs> I still think he had a snack, and he just grew out of it there. <laughs> hey, how about series. if he was wearing those old tearaway jerseys? Remember when the college yep. players, he'd go through about 100 of those during the course of a game. Spotter today, Malibu Kelly Hayes saying that this is the first time that he had ever seen a situation where the quarter didn't end when the scoreboard showed all zeros. This will be the last play. They take the reverse. Ron Johnson with the ball. Down close to the 31-yard line and going to be very close to a first down as that will bring to conclusion the first quarter. Shea Muirbrook came up with the tackle. So we'll swap positions on the field. We'll take a break. We'll be back with second quarter action in a moment. Of the Wasatch Mountain Range, that's 330 feet in length. It was established back in 1917. It's become a signature trademark here outside the campus of BYU. And it's all white again. It's all <laughs> it was painted red earlier. They had 15 people patrolling it through the night to make sure it stayed white this time. Now follow up breaks it. Will he go all the way? There's your first touchdown of the ball game. Chris. Well, Matu Maafala, 274 pounds, goes 32 yards for the opening score. And it looks like he just broke through the right side of that line. The whole defense set up. But as soon as he can get through in a short yardage situation, watch the blocking up front on the right side. Chris Ray, 66, the tight end, 84, sealed. That's Rick Tucker, and he has the speed to break away. That's what makes this guy so remarkable is his speed, and we might have an excess of celebration rule. Yes, we did. I think you heard the referee. So they'll mark that off after the kickoff, the excess of celebration, which occurred in the end zone 
after the touchdown. So the score stands. We get ready for the conversion attempt. That's a break! I think everybody was somewhat <laughs> in shock that uh, here's Jack Baker again. The dead ball, unsportsmanlike conduct penalty will be assessed on the kickoff. And really, I didn't see anything, Gary, that occurred in the end zone after the play. We'll try and see if we can pick something up. But I of just course, they, they, they police that heavily nowadays. And All I saw was a runaway truck. <laughs> <laughs> His number was 14. Conversion attempt is good. Daniel Pulsifer bangs it through the uprights. So it's a 7-0 lead. And the Utes have won the last two get the early score. James Dye and Jason Cooper are the return men. This one may end up out of bounds. It does. Well, let's take a look at some of the numbers from the first 15 minutes of play in the first quarter. And I think perhaps the biggest surprise of the entire first quarter was the fact that we went to the quarter break in a scoreless ball game. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Utah with a more balanced attack, 110 total yards. They got 48 through the air. And, of course, they had the edge in time of possession. Sarkeesian with the one interception. But keep in mind the 32-yard touchdown scamper by Mafala is not included in these stats. So, uh, actually... Utah has 142 total yards so far in this football game, so they, they have an advantage so far over BYU. But I'll tell you what, BYU got great field position with the unsportsmanlike penalty and the kick that went out of bounds by Pulsifer. They get the ball at midfield. Start right at the 50-yard line. So that's a break for the Cougars. You mentioned that time of possession in the first quarter favoring Utah. BYU 6-0 this year when they control time of possession. Now they haven't controlled it thus far in this one, and they trail by seven. Let's see how they answer that. Ball is deflected, but it is caught by Johnston. He's out of bounds after picking up close to six yards, down to about the 44-yard line. Notre Dame and Air Force is coming up a little later on. Wyoming jumping out to a big lead early over Fresno State. That one now in the second half. New Mexico and Texas El Paso coming up later today. San Diego State playing in Hawaii. And that bears on the WAC Conference That one has major implications on the bowl picture. BYU wins and uh, San Diego State beats Hawaii. BYU wins the conference championship outright. Five teams in the running. Two of them will get a chance for postseason play. Big hole. Mark Atuaya grinding down to about the 36-yard line. Talking about the business of the conference standing, I think Spags will get a chance to take a look. BYU trying to clinch it. They have a chance to control their own destiny. They're at 5-1 and one in the conference. And Air Force, Colorado State, Utah, and San Diego State all mathematically alive in this one. <laughs> As we mentioned, two teams out of that group of five get a chance to play in bowl games. First down, BYU. Motion man is Johnston. Inside handoff. Kamula tried to break or slip one tackle, but then he was pulled down. He gained maybe a yard. Olaveo from a linebacking position makes the tackle. Early second quarter on a magnificent afternoon in Provo, Utah, along with Holly Rowe on the sideline, John Spagnuolo in the booth. I'm Gary Gerald. Time to check out some of your keys, game stories for this one today. Well, for BYU offensively, they have to protect Sarkeesian. They're going to move him around in the pocket. And, of course, the front seven have got to tackle Malfala. I have not seen that so far here today. They have to shore things up defensively in that front seven and keep Malfala from breaking into the secondary. Sarkeesian being blitzed. He gets it off and completes the pass at the 34-33 yard line. Hamuli was on the receiving end. There was heavy pressure coming in that time, and he got rid of it just in time. Armand Boglin, the linebacker, was coming with a defensive rush. Game stories on the uh, Utah side. Well, Utah, again, they run the setup to pass. I think they've been able to do that so far in this football game, and their defensive ends have got to contain Sarkeesian. They have to keep him from being able to break outside of the pocket to make big plays, throwing the football. Third down and seven. 
Sarkeesian under a four-man rush. Unable to hang on to it with Neely at tight end. Ball was just off his extended fingertips, and he couldn't quite pull it in. So fourth down coming up. Monday on ABC's NFL Monday Night Football, nine-time All-Pro wide receiver Jerry Rice and the 49ers heading south to take on Dan Marino and company, the Miami Dolphins. And Jeff Fahey goes undercover to bust bad cops on an all-new episode of The Marshall. So don't miss action Monday night right here on ABC. That's going to be a great matchup involving the Niners and the Dolphins. Field goal attempt from the 40-yard line. The kick on the way from Hanson, and it is good. <laughs> that was spotted at the 40. It's a 50-yarder, and he nailed it. Bill Hanson's knocking it down, and so it is a career long, and BYU is on the board. And didn't see it in the first quarter, but here we are now at 7-3, and things are tightened up. That's right, and one of the reasons both these teams are battling for the WAC uh, championship is because they're playing good defense this year. And I think we've seen that so far in this football game. But what a field goal by Bill Hanson. It got this crowd into the game. A career long for him, and it points off that upright and goes through. Hanson kicking off now, drives it down. About a yard deep. Cal Beck brings it out. Ooh. Man, is he hit just short of the 20-yard line. And you talk about the crowd and BYU being bumped up. Now a late penalty flag comes fluttering in. Derek Bates got in there and put the wood to him. And uh, this is the way BYU's been playing all year. I mean, every game, it seems like they're knocking some people out of the game. Ryan Fien for UCLA was knocked out of a game. Dead ball, personal foul on the defense. 15-yard first down. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was knocked out of the game this year. Let's see if we can hit the, see this hit again by Derek Bates. Oh, right there. My. And that's a tremendous hit. And I don't know, that, that can't be the personal foul. The flag came much later than that. The play had, had come to conclusion, and I can only assume that it was something else. Well, you know, that's the one concern about a major rivalry like this, is the guys are so emotional that sometimes they make mistakes with that emotion, and you have to be able to control that as a head coach. Bates with a big hit on the kickoff, though. Yesterday when we were talking with the uh, coordinators for BYU, the defensive coordinator, Ken Schmidt, we were asking about, do you have to kind of detune these guys and bring them down a little bit? He said, yeah, sometimes you do. You don't want them absolutely sky high. You want intensity, but you've got to be able to execute. That's going long. He's got a man catch at the sideline it will be out of bounds at the 31 yard line Kevin Dyson Boy, he did a nice job of getting to the ball but they'll bring it back to the line of scrimmage incomplete good coverage by Tim McTire it's the second time today they've tried to go up top you see the pump fake by Fouts they're trying to take advantage of McTire's aggressiveness and watch Dyson's out of bounds you can't go out of bounds and come back it can make a catch didn't matter he was out of bounds when he made the catch anyway but uh, Utah taking their chances downfield. They've tried to go deep now three or four times in this football game. See Dyson's numbers on the air. He's wide left. This time it's a handoff. Now a follow who had the touchdown run. Strung out rather nicely. And that's one of the keys that BYU wanted to be able to do. The ball loose down there and a scramble. But I think it will still be Utah ball. It will. We talked how defensively they don't want that young man to be able to run straight ahead, north and south, as they say in football parlance. They want him to go east and west, and that time they yeah. did a pretty good job. That's right. You want him upfield. Look at Mafala carrying that ball a little recklessly. It pops out. Oh, that ball's on the field. Stop it right there. You can see in the left corner of the screen. We'll get back to that in a second. That ball was out well before he hit the ground. McTire was the guy who came slamming in there. Tim McTire and may have knocked it loose. Well, we're going to get a timeout taken here by Utah now. They were looking at a third and six situation, just under 12 minutes to go in the first half. And on the sideline, Ron McBride, the six-year coach, contemplating things. Let's take another look at this, Spags. See, my folly goes the ball up in the air. 
And he gets hit there by McTire. Now the ball should squirt out. Hold it right there. You'll see the ball on the left side a little bit more. Running a little bit more right there under the feet of the players of BYU. There's the ball on the ground. That ball came out clearly before Mafala hit the ground. Well, Utah gets a big break then, and that's uh, evidenced by that particular replay. And there's McTire. I mean, there's a cornerback. Cornerbacks aren't supposed to hit you. Just ask Deion Sanders. He'll tell you. Well, McTire loves Deion Sanders. That's one of his heroes. ABC kicking off your Thanksgiving weekend. Coming up with more great gridiron action Thursday at 9. Mountain Time, Georgia takes out Georgia Tech. And then Friday, our doubleheader kicks off with Purdue meeting Indiana. A battle for the old oaken bucket, plus other regional action. Then at 12.30 Mountain, Oklahoma going against number one Nebraska in a big national showdown. So check your local listings for the game in your area. Call your cable operator for the games available on pay-per-view Thanksgiving weekend right here on ABC Sports. Keep in mind, these campuses are only, what, 45 miles apart, so you talk about a great collegiate rivalry. A lot of folks coming down from Salt Lake City. Let's check in on the sidelines again with uh, Holly. Utah quarterback Mike Fouts told me that this offense is not geared towards just one receiver. That's why there's so many guys on their team with 49, 50 receptions. He says he looks at anybody and everybody because he has confidence in all of his guys. And right now, Holly, he's got three wide receivers to the right side. He looks right, throws it on the slant to Henry. Henry with some running room across the 50-yard line down to the 47. A lot of versatility and a lot of different variations being displayed and bounced that time on the slant to Henry. John Ross came up and made the stop. And that's another variation of the quick screens that the Utes love to run so well. Henry comes inside. He got a great block from Darren Walker, his center, number 55. And those centers love to get out there and hit people in the open field. 15-yard gain. Boy, look at NC State today. Big over Wake Forest as we've been rolling through some scores here. This is the time of the year when all the traditional rivalries come up. One of the great high points of any collegiate football season. Fouts right down the middle. This connects. Looking for Henry once again at the 34-yard line. But <laughs> I think Jamie, Jamie Cook can't believe he broke on the ball. He almost broke on the ball too quickly. He got there too soon. Again, it was a two-man pattern by Utah. They're working one player underneath and a player over the top. Jamie Cook had a break on the football and actually overran it a little bit. Backing into the Utah backfield is Rob Hamilton, who is frequently used as a blocking back now in this second down situation. He replaced Lusk. Henry is split wide to the near side. Malafala with the ball. He's not going anywhere this time. Stopped short of the line of scrimmage. Lane Hale out of the defensive secondary. Number 25 comes up big to help out. Well, you need a lot of help to bring that big freshman down. Ran Lane. out of his shoe this time. <laughs> He's out of a jersey. He's out of a shoe. He may not have a uniform by the time this game's over today. Lane Hale, 25, steps up. He comes in as a nickelback. He's an all-academic whack, number 25. He's filling his side. See how he maintains his leverage on the backside of the football? And he gets some help from 75, Matt Redden, too. That's the discipline of this defense. If they overrun, Mafala can, can cut the football back. Penalty marker was down on the field. We could hear the referee, Jack Baker, in the background. The penalty assessed against BYU has advanced the ball to the 42-yard line. You were talking about the play of the nickelback Hale there, Lavelle Edwards. High in his praise for tremendous improvement in his defensive secondary when we had a chance to visit in his office yesterday. Malafala again has finally knocked him off his feet but the whistles had sounded before he got bumped back to the 50-yard line. Stan Ross coming in there. And he was the initial man and then Ed Keel also helping out the Loss in the play moves the ball back to the 45. Yeah, Stan Ross, number 50, on the left side of your screen, you see he plays off the tackles block, Chris Ray, real well, and just walls that off, and he doesn't give the running back any room to go. 
Stan Ross, of course, the twin brother of John Ross. I don't know how your twin brother and your 50 or 40 pounds lighter than your brother. But That's an intriguing one. They say they look the same in the face, but there is a 40-pound weight differential. Third and eight. Bouts has a man. It's Henry out of bounds inside the 30. He found that little hole out there, and Bouts had protection, was able to link up with his favorite receiver. Rocky Henry, 17-yard reception. He's a guy who has the speed and is learning to run more disciplined routes. See, he just runs downfield and gets that zone to stretch deep, and boy, that ball was delivered on time by Mike Bouts. James Dye was the defender, and he was playing well off the intended receiver, and you had said initially coming in this was going to be a big day for James Dye because with the injury to Dumel Reed, Dye might find himself being picked on. Ron Johnson crashing inside the 20 to the 18. Boy, they yeah. are driving the ball on BYU's defense right now. Brad Martin with the tackle. You know, you raise a good point there about James Dye, but actually they've gone deep on McTire today. A couple times they've tried to throw deep. But Dye, uh, of course, played for Jermel Reed, who had a knee problem, did not play last week. And he's playing in there today. And watching Malafala on the sidelines, he's not in the backfield at the moment. It looked like they might have been addressing some type of problem down around his quarter ankle. Jamel Reed is now in the defensive secondary. The inside handoff to Johnson, turning inside the 15. Picks up a tough yard or two before Matt Redden, along with a host of other blue and white jerseys, pulls him down. Well, Utah taking advantage of the fact that they had a fumble earlier in this drive, and they're being able to sustain this drive right now. It's a ball control drive. They're mixing in the passes and running real well and converting some third downs, keeping the chains moving as they get another first down here. Utah leading this one seven to three. Malafala started onto the field, but then goes back to the sideline, so he will miss this play. It will be a first down opportunity for Mike Fox and the Utes. Got all kinds of movement here. And now, this is in flag flying everywhere. Flag on the flag. Rick Tucker, the tight end, may have been guilty of some movement. Dead ball. Ball start on the offense. Five yard penalty. First down. Take a look now. Oh, it's the guard position that jumps before uh, Tucker actually moves. And look who pays for it. <laughs> the tackle, Chris Ray. Pays for his guard made the <laughs> mistake. He's going to talk to him in the huddle right now saying, hey, listen, Barry, you're going to jump off sides. Just make sure I don't get popped in the head like that. Barry Sims was the man who made the initial movement from the right guard position. Ron Johnson getting a Num numerous carries here with Malafala on the sideline and unable to generate much that time. Now keep in mind, Juan Johnson was the starter earlier this year. Then he suffered a turf toe problem and uh, he missed most of the month of October. And that's when Malafala came into his own as a running back. Ball at the 13-yard line. Second down, eight and a half minutes to go in the first half. Utah leading BYU 7-3. Could be an audible situation from Fox. Inside handoff. Johnson into the 10, down to the 8-yard line. Let's check in with Holly Rowe, our sideline reporter once again. Holly? Chris Maafala was kicked in the shin. Bill Bean, the trainer, has examined him. He said it is a bruised shin. He's in a lot of pain, but he should be able to play throughout the rest of the game. Okay, well, that explains why we hadn't seen him. We saw them working down there on the bench and suspicion that perhaps... There was an injury problem. You see Malafala on the sideline as we check the ABC Sports scoreboard once again. Northwestern with a two-touchdown advantage over Purdue. Oh, what a great year Northwestern's Wildcats have enjoyed. Third down. Bounce with a slant pattern and incomplete. Rocky Henry, the intended receiver, and Bounce delivered that one to his shoe tops and no chance for a reception. I am not. I think Fouts felt pressure when there really wasn't pressure. He seemed to, to throw that off his back foot and had no velocity on the football as he's trying to get the ball as a, in a slant into Henry. And let's see if he, he seems to throw off his back foot. Look, 
Yeah, he's just not set. His feet aren't set to make the kind of throw he needs to make on that play. And Henry, of course, was well covered by Dermell Reed. Terrence Keyhand a hold for Daniel Pulsifer. Pulsifer's had a great year kicking field goals. He's hit 15 of 20. This one will be a 25-yard attempt. We have whistles. There was a penalty marker down. And I believe I heard the whistle prior to the actual swing of the leg there. So we will wait and see. It's fourth down and four to go. If this penalty works against BYU by any chance. No, I think I think it's delay a game, way. or that's what Pulsifer seemed to signal over to his sideline. Dead ball. Delay a game on the offense. Five yard penalty. Fourth down. Oh boy, a missed field goal. He gets to kick it again. It's really a, a break for Utah that they took too much time to kick that football. Two breaks on this drive. No fumble and a delay a game penalty. And now he gets to line this thing up again. Ball will be spotted now back just a fraction inside the 20-yard line. This is a mulligan. How many times <laughs> you get mulligans in football? 29-yard attempt down the way. And he says, thank you very much. Yes. And we have a 10-3 ball game. Utah trying to make it three in a row over their arch rival, BYU. See the numbers on the scoring drive for Utah. Pulsiver converting from 29 yards out to make it a 10-3 ball game with 7.23 remaining in this second quarter. In the deep spots, Die number six. Jason Cooper just up in front of him by about five yards as Pulsifer awaits the command to turn it loose. <laughs> Utah with a six and four. Look at this guy. Look at the record of the crowd. Take up the. Somebody's got, to, somebody's got to tell him he's on the road here. <laughs> <laughs> Flat split kick out of the 18 yard line. Tom Baldwin, who doesn't get many opportunities to return kicks, gets this one out to about the 35 yard line, and there's a massive humanity. Well, you know, in the month of November, Lavelle Edwards, BYU Cougars have put together a pretty impressive record over the last six years, but two losses, and guess who? Utah, the last two years in this great rivalry. By the same scores, 34-31, both games hard fought and won right at the end. There's a lot to this rivalry, and uh, believe me, there's some Cougar players and fans uh, who don't like the idea that their neighbors down the road here have, uh, have been able to win the last two in a row here. Bill Edwards said he put more pressure on himself because of those losses in this big game in the last couple of years. From the 34-yard line, Sarkeesian, a little play action fake being chased. Oh, what a great defensive play by Chad Kahaha. He came in there like nobody got a hand on him. Well, you have to be able to set this kind of stuff up with a running game. Up until now, BYU has only rushed for 32 yards. Utah has 106. And Kahaha stays at home. This is a naked. That means the quarterback doesn't have a guard helping him, doesn't have anybody else coming out. They're supposed to fool Kahaha with the action of the play. And it's a loss of eight yards. Kahaha stays at home and plays within the discipline of this defense. I would also like to thank Chad for shortening his name for us. He <laughs> says we can call him Kahaha because actually with a Hawaiian and Samoan touch, you would add a couple of more syllables in there. Talk about budget cuts. Occasion, a couple of pump picks, now keeps it up the sideline, gets back up near the initial line of scrimmage where this series started. Faumoy bumping him out of bounds. Again, Sarkeesian under siege, trying to find some time downfield. And he's trying to go to Mike Johnston here. Watch Johnston, almost seems like as he runs his cut, starts to almost give up on the play. See how he settles now? Here Sarkeesian is saying, hey, hey, I'm still, I still have the football. What are you doing? And Johnston turns and blocks for him. Good. Johnston's got to get involved in this offense here today. Now third and 10 for BYU, trailing 10 to three. Look right through the second quarter. They're in their home turf. You showed blitz, but they rush only four men. The ball's deflected, and now it's picked off. At the 30-yard line, Armin Boglin, the linebacker, 
Chad Kahaha, I think, was the man. Yeah, look at that celebration. He was the one that deflected it and pounced it high in the air. So the second interception on the part of the youth defense today. And that's Steve Kafusi, the defensive line coach. His brother plays on this team, Henry Kafusi, and he's excited about the play of Kahaha on that series. First watch number 45 on the right side. Time has jumped. Gets a big paw. He did. Hit him almost in the shoulder pads, didn't it? And then Armin Boglin is in position to make the interception. That's the second interception today by the Utes. Get another look at it. Sarkeesian steps up but just hits Kahaha. It looked like he hit him right in the right shoulder pad. Kahaha jumped up so high. First interception this year for Boglin. From the 30-yard line in BYU territory. Bounce. Going for Brooks. Got him in. Deflected. No good. Dyson was there. Tim McKayer doing the uh, defensive work, and that was a pretty good battle deep in the end zone to see who was going to come away with that football. That's right. Boy, sometimes an errant tip like that can go against you. McTire was in excellent shape to make the play, and the thing tipped harmlessly down to the ground. At the conclusion of today's game, we'll be selecting a genuine Chevrolet most valuable player of the game from each squad. To date, Chevrolet has contributed almost five and a half million dollars to the scholarship funds of America's colleges and universities. Second and ten. Door shin to about the 25 yard line. So it's going to be third and a bunch, close to five or six yards. A chance to check some other scores. East Carolina with a nifty win today. You know, and, that, and that shin will not hurt as much if he can pad it up or protect it today. But believe me, tomorrow and the next day, mm. that's going to be awfully sore. They better get some extra sturdy crutches to help him walk around if, he, if he's limping around campus. He could bend those babies pretty easily, I would think. Huh? <laughs> no padding on it, though. Well, that is painful to get kicked in the shins. Third down, out of the shotgun. Softly over the middle, the catch is made for a first down at the 16-yard line. It's the tight end, Rick Tucker, on the receiving end. Yeah, Tucker's working in the zone there with Shea Muirbrook covering him, the middle linebacker. But he was able to work himself to the outside and make a key catch to convert a first down. Big fella. Listed at nearly 250 pounds from California, 6'4". He had some knee problems that had uh, hampered him thus far this season, but coming up with a catch, his 19th of the year. And Fouts is doing an excellent job of spreading that football around to all of his receivers. This is Ron Johnson. Oh, you hear the pop. Man, there's some serious <laughs> combat going on down there right now. I, I really like this guy, Tim McTire. I mean, again, that's a cornerback. He's only 5'11", 170. But when a guy like that can step up and stick somebody, he inspires an entire defense. Watch number 21. Get off the block of the wide receiver. Get up there and hit Johnson. Wrap him up and bring him down to the ground. That truly is inspiring for a defense. So make it second down now. Still 10 from the 16. Utah in possession, leading 10-3. Four and a half minutes remaining in this first half. Now a follow. And a penalty marker comes in late as he went churning off that right side of the O-line. And you know, if there's been one Achilles heel so far this year for Utah, it's been their plus 20 offense or their red zone offense. They've been forced to kick a lot of field goals. We see the preliminary signal and that's something that's hurt them this year and it's hurting them in, again here today well let's go down and learn more about mctire we've seen him with some great hits today let's check in with holly tim mctire is earning a big reputation for a hard hitter he says he's not the strongest guy in the world so he's had to learn how to hit hard and get the respect of the other players he's earning that and he has nicknamed cougar stadium the house of pain he says anyone that comes in here is going to get a hard hitting welcome mat Gary? Well, we have a little gremlin here in the in the system. We couldn't hear uh, at least uh, I know up here. We I know hear. Holly had something good to say, and I bet we're going to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> Holly knows these clubs well, and she has really been uh, doing a terrific job of generating stories and information for us the last couple of days. And when I broadcast today, delighted to have her on the sidelines. Second down and 19. Making the catch is Rocky Henry. 
and it's good at the eight yard line for Rocky Henry's everywhere you just see tough guy to keep track of he's caught 49 balls coming into this game this season and now he has added some numbers with a 17 yard pickup here yeah he's working on Dermel Reed it's a 17 yard reception and he just works back to the sidelines again you made the point earlier it looked like the cornerbacks are not closing quickly enough there is just I'll tell you what that is good defense by Reed that is just a perfectly executed pass pattern as Henry takes it upfield and then breaks pivots outside and makes the reception as a consequence it's third and two lost in motion Malafaro, he's not going to get the first down thrown for a loss Stan Ross there to lead the defensive surge number 50 so a field goal opportunity now for Pulsifer who hit one earlier from 29 he will try to extend the lead to 10 points for the Utes and the co-captain Stan Ross makes a big play to keep Mahafala from getting the first down there and again Utah has to tee up and go for a field goal and they've done a lot of that in the last couple of games. They had three field goals against Wyoming and four field goals two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, I should say, against Utah State. He hammers this one through, so Pulsifer continues to do a fine job here for Utah. And the Utes now have a 13-3 lead with just over three minutes to play in this second quarter. of mid-November in Provo, Utah, outside Cougar Stadium as we check in with John Saunders in our studios in New York. Coming up next on the Prudential Halftime Report, we'll have full details of Ray Goff's agreement to leave Georgia. Also highlights of Tennessee struggling, plus number two and number three in action as well. That in a moment. Okay, John, were you surprised at Goff's, uh, that move? That well, I was this year because he lost his two key players, Mike Bobo, the quarterback, and George Edwards, who was just lighting things up in the SEC as a running back, and it, it's tough to fire a coach when he has so many key players knocked out. Pulsifer drives it deep. It goes into the end zone, or did it get out just ahead of the pylon? The official indicates it will be touchback. No penalty flag down there, so... They will bring it out to the 20 and with 302 to go in the first half. BIU will try it once again. Well tomorrow at Eastern Steffi Graf that's at one o'clock Eastern meets Anka Huber in the finals as Carell presents the WTA championships and at four Eastern three Central and Pacific American champion Todd Eldridge and in the elite international field of skating's blazing young stars hit the ice. We'll be featuring the men's and the pairs competition from the Sudafed Skate America International tomorrow on ABC. BYU averaging 27 points a game. They have just three thus far, but trying to get something going here is Bloomfield. Rumbles out across the 30. To full Bloomfield doing a nice job with some running room around the wide right side. 200 pound sophomore from the state of Utah. I really like Bloomfield. I think uh, this guy is really coming into his own as a football player. You know, they alternate their backs and use a, a three-back rotation here at BYU, but he's shown some speed and some real power when he's gotten to football lately. First down for Sarkeesian and company. Again, excellent protection. Pass incomplete. The intended receiver was Jason Cooper. It was almost hard to tell whether uh, Sarkeesian wanted to go to Attili Mooley or to Cooper on that play. Mooley was dragging across from the left side of the tight end position. Stops the clock with 2.36 remaining now in the quarter. Ball just the nose of the ball over the 30-yard line. Crowd a little restless, a little frustrated here on the campus of BYU at the lack of scoring opportunities. Akawaya pulled down, but he gains only a couple of yards. Gotta blow a few more whistles down there. That's <laughs> boys are really popping each other and they don't want to stop. Checking some of the top 25, Ohio State. Look at that. Only by 39 today. Florida rambling at the expense of Vandy. 
Tennessee. Yeah. Kentucky muscled up on that one. That was a surprise. They were down in that football game by a couple right. of touchdowns. Florida State with big numbers once again. That sets up that matchup with the Gators and the Seminoles next week. From the 34-yard line, third down for Sarkeesian. This one is not down. Boy, there's that man, Kahaha, once again. He deflected one that resulted in an interception. And he is making his presence felt on the right side of the offensive line for Lavelle Edwards, BYU Cougars. Yeah, Matt Maservi is the right tackle, and he's doing a good job in that. He's standing in front of Kuhaha. See number 61 on the right side. But he's just got to get a little stouter with his protection. And there's not enough separation, really, between Maservi and uh, Sarkeesian. And that's why Kuha has been able to bat down a couple. This one falls to the ground, but before, of course, he caused the interception. Alan Boardman with the punt. Floats it lazily down to about the 28-yard line where Lusk has nowhere to go. Stop literally in his tracks. So we get the exchange of possession with a minute 39 remaining on a 38-yard punt. Utah leading this one 13 to 3 as they take over now in their own territory at the 28 yard line. You know the BYU defense so far this year has been particularly tough in the second quarter giving up only 13 points in the second quarter for the entire season. Utah has scored 13 points in the second quarter here today. Dyson split way out to the far side. Bouts finds his familiar freshman running back, and Malafala gets a couple to the 31-32 yard line. Let's go down to the sidelines once again, and here's Holly Rowe. The quarterback for the University of Utah, Mike Fouts, is an interesting story. He had no scholarship. He just applied around to several different colleges. He got accepted to the U, so he got in his car, drove up to Utah, decided to talk to the football coaches. He never even started a varsity game in high school, so it's a big surprise that he's starting now. He says this young team is very surprising. He said the nice thing about being young is sometimes you're so naive, you don't know that you're not supposed to be winning. <laughs> Isn't that the it's truth? An interesting angle. Bounce looking. Oh, he's in trouble now, and down he goes at the 28-yard line. Stan Ross had him earmarked almost all the way when he saw him step up in the pocket. Bouts coming in as a redshirt last year, completed 54% of his passes this season. He's the nephew of Dan Fouts. I don't know if we had mentioned that at any time, Spags. That's pretty good uh, family football lines to be related to. There he is, Dan Fouts. Boy, he could throw the football with that charger pack. Did he put up some there? numbers? Did he ever? Kellen Winslow. Henry can't hang on this time out of the 43-yard line. Rocky Henry has had a couple of big receptions, and he's one of the key reasons that Utah is leading at this point, 13 to 3, and time is run down to 17 seconds to go in the half. Well, in Utah's game against Utah State, they got a little talking to at halftime from Ron McBride, and I got a feeling he's going to do it again here. I'm sure he would have liked to have had some more points here going into the halftime, and that was not a very good execution of a two-minute offense. They get a chance to see James die in action. He's a great punt return man as Pulsifer booms it out of there. This one is going to bounce and go out of bounds. So they continue to try to kick the ball away from Die. Die has some of the best return numbers in the country, bar none. And he hasn't had a chance to exhibit his skills. A 34-yard punt as it went out of bounds. So 12 seconds to go as we get set now for the final plays of this first half. And of course, a reminder that coming up in our Prudential Halftime Report, John Saunders will have scores and highlights from all of today's action. BYU will be starting at their own 36, but time for only a couple of plays. We'll see what they elect to do if they try to go deep here and generate something out of the shotgun. Here's Sarkeesian. Four-man rush. Got him down at the 32, and now a penalty marker comes in. He wanted to look long, but taking that extra time, Palmuri and Nate Kia were there to pull him down. Well, Utah stayed with a four man rush, they didn't go to a three man rush with the prevent and all that stuff that you normally see, and that 
pocket collapsed rather quickly. And right now, I would say the defensive linemen for Utah are setting the tone in this game. On the defense, five yard penalty, five yards from the previous spot, repeat first down. Well, that's incidental conduct to get the five yards. Let's take a look. Matt Kia, number 88, you see him collapsing the pocket. It's getting collapsed from inside. And I'm not sure, I don't think Kia got his hand on Sarkeesian's face mask. It happened from a tackle inside. It might have been Kafusi, number 57. So we have a timeout now on the field. Utah with six penalties for 45 yards. And but six seconds left now in the quarter as BYU will try to come up with something here, trailing 13 to three in a surprisingly low scoring game thus far. Well, the best thing they can do right here is drop back the quarterback to a side of the football field and just throw the football as far as Sarkeesian can possibly throw it. There's Mafala on the sidelines, resting himself. You see the number six on his helmet, but the number 14 on the jersey. But look at that time of possession, Utah dominating Absolutely. this football game so far. Absolutely. Talked about surprising the fact that the Cougars have only three points when you consider that they scored 31 against New Mexico last week, 45 against Tulsa, 45 against Hawaii. That's about 120 points in the last three games. So Utah's defense has been very effective. Lavelle Edwards pacing the sidelines like a caged tiger right now. I don't think he's real happy with the turnovers and the execution of his offense here today. And They'll go into halftime here unless they get a miracle play right here, down 10 points. Occasion right down the middle, the ball was deflected. He was trying to go to Himuli out of the backfield, and somebody got a hand on it and tipped it. He'll get one more shot. I think it was Jason Hooks who had a finger up there on the ball, or fingers. <laughs> Well, they tried to get the ball to Hemeli, and I guess it just tried to see if he could make something happen as a running back. See if they might uh, institute the uh, Cal Stanford uh, band play here, or uh, no, I guess you do that at the end of the game, don't you? A little early to start that. Yeah, we'll make that a, a second half. Extravaganza. <laughs> Should be the final play of the half. Deep to the far side. Oh, a great interception snagged by Clarence Lawson. And Lawson trying to find some running room to the 35 and down, and that will do it. So for the third time in a matter of 30 minutes of playing time, Sarkeesian has been picked off. That time he overthrew his receiver, and an easy pickoff for Clarence Lawson. 13-3 is our halftime score here at Pro Bowl. CFA College Football on ABC Sports. Brought to you by Jiffy Lube. If it doesn't say Jiffy Lube, it just isn't Jiffy Lube. And Chevrolet, the cars and trucks 36 million people depend on every day. Genuine Chevrolet. Stay tuned for the Prudential Halftime Report after this message and a word from our ABC stations. 15 to 3, our score at halftime. The Utes leading the Cougars. Only one touchdown scored, surprisingly, in the first 30 minutes of this one, but what a run it was, 32 yards. The big freshman from Hawaii, Malafala, and boy, what a load. He is, and he gets the penetration through the Cougar defense, and 275 pounds. It's hard to believe a guy that big can run that fast. You could see him almost explode there. He, that little gesture there, the Chaka from Hawaii, he got a 15-yard unsportsmanlike penalty, but that did not take them off the board. They lead 13-3 to as we get ready to start the second half of action. Utah will be receiving. Getting ready to handle the kicking chores is Bill Hansen. Hansen hit a 50-yard career-long field goal for the only three points for the Cougars. Peniel Etheridge from the goal line. Looked out just across the 20-yard line. Let's check first half numbers. 13 to 3, our score. Time of possession, I know, is going to be an interesting number here, Spags. Look at that. Better than 20 and a half minutes for Utah. Yeah, 2 to 1 ratio. The other numbers, BYU total offense, they average over 400 yards a game, not even at the century mark here in the first half. They have to step it up offensively. If they're going to get back in this football game, they have to execute their offense. And Utah again with 232 total yards, and the three turnovers have hurt the Cougar team today. 
Sarkeesian for the first time being intercepted three times in a game. The Utes trying to grind away, and boy, the BYU defense all muscling up there, led by Matt Redden, as Mahafala had no place to go that time. He had 80 yards rushing in the first half, 15 carries for 80 yards, including the touchdown run we saw just a couple of moments ago. And the defense got to get this uh, team back in the football game. That kind of penetration, getting people flying around to the football. Ken Schmidt, the defensive coordinator, no doubt put the onus on his defense that you got to get his good field position and get the football back. Utah, of course, would love to have a good uh, drive here to open the second half and put more points on. Now a follow across the 25 to the 26-yard line this time. He'll be shy of the first down by about four yards, maybe five. We'll see where they end up spotting the ball. He got kicked in the shin. You heard Holly's report in the first half, and that seemed to slow him down a little bit. He wasn't nearly as effective in the second quarter as he was uh, after that touchdown run, which was on the first play of the second quarter, than he was early in the ball game. And Todd Jackson just limped off the field, number 69, the left guard. You see the first half possessions are. Tyson stood out to the far side. Lusk in the slot. He third down. Foul cross to throw. He does, and it's broken up. And there are no flags in Brunel Reed. The fellow who was, well, there is a flag now. Oh, boy, a late flag right came down. in from the side judge. And let's see if he detected whether Dermel Reed got a hand on the receiver. Well, he played him tight. There wasn't any doubt about it. He's playing hurt. He had a knee injury against Tulsa. He sat out last week's ball game for the Cougars against New Mexico. Pass interference on the defense. Out of the foul. First down. Well, that one elicits a chorus of booze from the hometown fans as we take another look. Let's watch Dermel Reed. He drives Terrence Key in number 18. And yeah, he does get that left arm around him. And that is an accurate call by the side judge. Uh, he could have broken on the football. I don't know if he needed to keep that left hand there in order to bat the ball down with his right hand, but he did. He got caught in his first down for Utah. From the 33 now, Utes leading by 10. Tyson. And McTire pushes him out of bounds at the 38-yard line. And, oh, look at the emotion there. <laughs> McTire <laughs> stripped the football out. But Dyson was out of bounds when he did it. But McTire, I mean, just shows you, again, this guy is the catalyst for this defense. He'll do anything he can to get this defense going. Watch McTire now. He drives the football. Now he starts trying to steal that football out. He does successfully get it out. But, of course, Dyson's out of bounds, so it's not a turnover. Scrappy player, isn't he? Well, indeed he is. Big. Defensive coordinator Ken Schmidt was talking yesterday about the closest thing to a character probably that they have on that defensive unit. Trying to power straight ahead is Juan Johnson to the 40-yard line. Be two, three yards short of another first down. And Utah will go with a two-back formation and use Rob Hamilton as a lead blocker as they did there. They'll go to the one-back. And line everybody up. There's Todd Jackson getting worked on on the sideline. The left guard looks like he's getting something checked out in the lower extremity. There. I'm sure Holly Rowe will have a, a report for us. Danny Davis had replaced him on the offensive line. Third down. Pitch out Johnson. Oh, nice job of reading the seam and getting back across the 45-yard line for the first down before Sampson and Bloomfield could bring him down. Good bit of work there because the initial defensive penetration turned him back inside. Yeah, they had outflanked him <laughs> defensively, but he was able to stretch it back inside and get upfield and get the first down yardage. A good cut by Johnson. Ron Johnson coming to the sideline. He added 11 pounds of muscle, they tell us, from last year when he checked in this season, and he has been a big ball carrier. Let's take a look here as he cuts back. Yeah, again, much like we saw in the touchdown run, the defense over-pursued. Well, a follow this time across midfield, and you can see him hobbling again. That shin has given him some problems. He probably got nicked on that shin again as he came through the uh, defensive line. And again, <laughs> every little bump on that thing is mm. just going to make him wince that much more. I, I'm surprised if it's a bruise, though, that they haven't put some sort of foam on it just no to protection. protect it a little yeah. bit. Yep. No protection uh, visible there at all. 
Johnson has gone back in. Fouts looking to the sidelines to pick up the play call. They've advanced into BYU territory. That time of possession number as this game progresses, they can continue to methodically move the ball like this. This will certainly work in the favor of Utah. They have now taken a timeout, as a matter of fact, here. So apparently a little confusion over what they wanted to run on this sequence. So time has been called. We have 11.46 to play in this third quarter. The Utes with the ball, leading by 10 as we take the break. We're going to be getting an update on an injury situation from Holly down on the sidelines, but right now coming out of the timeout, second down for Utah. Johnson inside the 45 to the 44, trying to still move that pile, and again, he's right there at first down territory. Let's check in now with Holly on that injury update. BYU defensive tackle Mike Ulafali did not return to the field for the second half. He's got a severe stinger. That is a big loss for BYU. He's one of their main frontline guys on the line. But uh, Henry Bloomfield has started the last four games because of Ulafali's suspension. So he's gotten a lot of experience. They shouldn't drop off much there. Gary? Well, Lavelle Edwards has certainly been in these types of situations many times in his career. There's Bloomfield now who fills in so capably. Very intense junior, listed at 290 pounds. He showed up three days late for training camp this year, and all of a sudden they said, wow, who's this guy? <laughs> J.C. transfer. It's nice when guys can show up halfway through training camp and make an impression. He was throwing people around and playing great football for him. Bout sets up with plenty of protection. Looking long. Overthrows the intended receiver, Keehan. Boy, he had a terrific opportunity there. Tonight at the uh, special time, Joan Collins, George Hearn, and Ashley Johnson star in the world premiere of Annie, a royal adventure on Saturday night at the movies. And Brett Butler hosts with Jeff Foxworthy, Shania Twain, Chicago, Paula Poundstone, and many others in the all-new Gala for the Presidents. Little Orphan Annie and a big new special tonight here on ABC. Second and ten, ball at the 48-yard line, just into BYU territory. Utah leading here in the early going of this third quarter. Juan Johnson with a spin move, breaks one tackle and gets inside the 40, close to the 36-yard line before he was tripped up. John Ross was there with a the tackle. Now let's take a look at the quarterback numbers coming in. You mentioned early, Spags, how... Sarkeesian is among the best in the country in total offense, but he's having a hard time generating any kind of numbers today. Yes, he is, and the three interceptions that have hurt his team, really the first one was his fault. I mean, that was one where he tried to make a big play early in the football game. The second one, the ball was batted, and the third interception was right before the half when he's trying to make a big play on a Hail Mary pass. So, uh, but uh, overall, BYU right now is being shut down by this new defense, and they can't get their hands on the football. Third and four. Pass complete to Lusk at the 30-yard line. Henry Lusk with a penalty marker on the far side of the field on the turf. And I'm very impressed with the way Utah's been running this offense. It's been methodical. They mixed the run and the pass together. Fred Graves, the offensive coordinator, doing a good job. They hurt themselves here with the penalty. They've distributed the ball to any number of different uh, areas, too. You've seen different uh, guys getting a hand on it here. Yeah, they have a lot of weapons. Henry Lusk is a tight end, wide receiver, gets the football. We've seen Formation Rock. Formation on the offense, six men on the line of scrimmage, five-yard penalty, repeat third down. Well, yeah. they, they were only one man short on the line of scrimmage. Got to have one. seven, that's <laughs> right. There's a... Uh, Matt Masturvey burying his head in his hands right now. I don't know if he's in pain or certainly too early to strike that pose if he's worried about the fortunes of his team. There's a lot of football left to play, but again, Utah eating up the clock almost five minutes here in the second half now. They've been able to kick off that clock. Third down, five wide receivers from the shotgun. It's Dyson. Get on his feet and down at the 27-yard line. Look for a moment as he made the catch as he slipped the initial defender that he might have a lot more running room. That's right, and that defender was Tim McTire, number 21. He flashed at the football but didn't get there in time. Watch 21, McTire driving the football. He sees the play, but no, he doesn't get there in time. And Henry's able to turn it upfield for a 15-yard gain, and they're able to keep the chains moving once again, so they overcome that penalty. 
Look at how much clock they've been able to use, too, in this particular drive. They're just methodically making their way down the field. From the 27, fourth reception today for Dyson. Seven yards as Mike Fouts finds Terrence Keehan. Keehan's second touchdown of the season. And the Utes have now taken a commanding 16-point lead prior to the extra point attempt. And this young man has great hands. We've heard that he's only dropped one pass all year. He came into the game with 14 catches. Working one-on-one -on -one with Dermell Reed. Reed not in good position to be able to make a play on that football. And Keehan worked down the sidelines and had a little extra room there. Good concentration on the football, and he gets into the end zone. Interesting story for this young man, a walk-on. He's from New Zealand, a native New Zealand, a walk-on two years ago. And, boy, what a great opportunity for him to make a huge contribution. He quickly capitalized. Now, one placement, Pulsifer will try, and he'll get a delay of game warning here, as apparently they were a man or two short. Yeah, and that's smart. Let's take one more look at this touchdown pass. Again, I'm impressed with Mike Fouts. He throws the football. He's got a very strong arm, and he just rips that thing out there on the line. Does not put much air under it. And Keehan gets into the end zone. The reason I said it's a smart play, what I didn't want to see Utah do, you don't want to call a timeout here, even though you don't have enough people on the field. Just move it back five yards, and it winds up um, being just a little bit more than an extra point. That's the first. Booms it through, and so this ball game is suddenly taking on a much different proportion than most of the fans here had expected today. 20 to 3, Utah. CFA College Football on ABC Sports brought to you by Chevrolet Trucks, the most dependable, longest lasting trucks on the road. And Tagamet HB, the most prescribed medication of its kind, now for Hartford. Bouts hitting three of four passes, 47 yards in that drive, leading to the touchdown pass to Keehan. They used five and a half minutes of clock on that possession to open the second half. Yeah, and the drive was kept alive, remember, early on by the interference call against Ermel Reed, and of course, he's victimized at the end on the touchdown. Pulsifer not only counting, but once again, playing to that corner of the stadium that is bathed in red. That's where the youth fans are located. This is Dye from the four-yard line. Oh, look out. He pops it outside. He gets across the 25, and there was about one man to get away from. Omar Bacon was there with the tackle, and he did a good job of containment because Dye is one of those quick striders, and he could have made things very interesting for the BYU fans. 25-yard return for Dye. He is exciting when he gets his hands on the football. For a small guy, he's not afraid to just turn it right up in the middle and let himself get hit. Here's your Yale score, and I'm sorry to report, Harvard Jeez, is the please. measure of you today, 22-21. I have to excuse myself. <laughs> no, I'll no, be right back. No, you stay right here. Not too wild. Trying to get a block. Oh, and he's popped as he just tried to turn the corner. Jeff Kirkman coming up as one of the safeties with a good hit. And we have seen some serious hitting going on in this one today as we go back to the sports board. Yeah, Kirkman, it's his first year he's been fully healthy on this football team. Leading tackler coming into this football game today and, uh, you know, not to short sell these guys. They, they got a couple of hitters in that secondary as well. Kirkman and Lust, the safeties, are the leading tacklers on this football team. From the 30-yard line, Sarkisian, who had thrown only one interception in the last three games, had three in the first half, stays on the ground for a five-yard pickup as Atuwaya turns ahead, gets out over the 35. And I think you see no panic here in the Cougar offense. They are uh, sticking to their game plan. They probably got away from it a little bit, but they have to be able to mix the run and pass effectively keep themselves out of third and long situations because the pass rush has really hurt them today so far. That Utah defensive front put a lot of pressure on Sarkeesian. Now they're in a third and medium range situation and it's, it's, it's an opportunity for them to convert and keep the chains moving. Well, you think about Only BYU. one for five today so far, though. Yeah. 
think about BYU football over the years and all the great quarterbacks that have come through here. Apparently, Mark down as we have movement. The pass is complete out over the 40-yard line. Mike Johnston. You just think about, you know, the Jim McMahon, the Steve Young, the Ty Detmers, the Robbie Boscos, and Sarkeesian trying to put his name in some very elite company, but having a tough time of it this afternoon. Sarkeesian did a good job, though. He drew the defense off sides. That's smart play by the quarterback. I think Henry Kafusi was the guilty man. And that's a cheap first down. If you can get him by penalty or you can get him any way you can, you want to do what you can right now for the Cougars to keep the football going. There's the Outside, Apple Cup score. On the defense, penalty is refused. First down. So the ball moved out to the 41-yard line. Back in the 1980 season, Jim McMahon threw for four and a half thousand yards. Sarkeesian had, what, 2,700 coming into this one today. Pretty impressive number, but that's what we talk about, the quarterback heritage at this place under Lavelle Edwards. Pretty impressive. Still holds the efficiency rating record, too, in college football, Jim McMahon does. Greenfield. It's across the 40 to about the 43, 44 yard line. These are the numbers that Sarkeesian has put up today and he's doing a little cheerleading here. Fourth in the nation at better than 310 yards. Those are the numbers coming in. Coaching staff, they label him as an exceptional guy. He has a tremendous number of skills, great person. Terrific baseball player. He was uh, got a look from a lot of the baseball folks initially in his athletic career. Hamuli <laughs> stopped cold. Armin Boglin is right there with the tackle. He may have gotten a yard as he gets to the 45-yard line. 65,829 packed into Cougar Stadium today enjoying this one. The bulk of those that are packed in here, maybe I'm premature in saying they're enjoying this because the bulk of them are BYU fans and they're on the short end of a 20 to three count right now. Nearly in motion. Here comes the blitz. They pick it up. He's got an in. He completes the ball at the 35 yard line to Jason Cooper. And what a great catch by Jason Cooper. There's a flag on the play. We'll check that out. Here's a guy who's waited very patiently over the years for his turn to play a senior. And unfortunately, this thing's going to be called back to BYU. Got an illegal Ocean. shift again. Yeah. They did a great job of picking up the defensive pressure. They had the blitz coming. Looked like a six-man rush that time, and they picked him up. But they don't get the yardage. And there's a look at Sarkeesian delivering the ball. And watch Cooper lay out to make this catch. Penalty moves the ball back, close to the 40-yard line. So it's third down to be repeated now. Penalty numbers today. Only the fourth against BYU for 31 total yards. Third and 11. Sarkeesian staying in the pocket. Over the middle, the ball's not blue, short of the 50-yard line. Boy, oh boy, and that penalty really hurts the Cougars. They had a first down, they had some momentum, and now they have to punt the football away. Abuli couldn't hang on quite long enough. You see him walking off. He really got popped by Oliveo, who came up there. So, a punting situation. Ball control has been on Utah's side. They took five and a half minutes off the clock to start the second half, and they got the touchdown to Kihad. Now they're about to get the ball back. Lusk from the 20-yard line. Dances away from one man. Look out as he gets across the 35, stumbles and falls at the 38-yard line. Nice return from Henry Lusk as we take the break here at Cougar Stadium in Provo. Five and a half to play in this third quarter. So as we welcome you back to Provo, John, we mentioned it's 31 years since Utah has won a WAC championship, and they're doing everything that they must do right now to keep their championship hopes alive and doing it very impressively. That's right, and BYU on the other side is not doing, or they're not doing the things they normally do. They're not executing well, they're 
receiving penalties at inopportune times. You know, they don't have the skill, they don't have the talented players to beat this Utah team. They have to execute well, and that's what's hurting them so far today. You've got to give credit to Utah. Miles Hurley getting up across the 40 to about the 43 as we check in with uh, Holly once again. Starting left guard for Utah is out. Todd Jackson has a severely sprained ankle. They've retaped it and he's been trying to walk it off on the sideline, but it doesn't look like he'll be coming back anytime soon. Hema Hamuli is the other story. He has got torn cartilage on his ribs. He was out of practice for part of this week. They kept him out of any contact drills. It's a key part of that last pass. He had the pass, but when they got hit on the rib, mm. kind of dropped the ball. So look for that to cause some problems for the offense. Boy, the dreaded enemy of any receiver is having to play with uh, ribs that are sore or currently has been torn. Here's a rare sack. His bounce goes down. Stan Ross leading the defensive charge. Stan Ross coming in on a blitz. Got to have a little bit more aggression here by the defense for the Cougars, so they're taking some chances. Colorado and K-State in a big game. Now tying in the third quarter. Hey, K-State's playing great football this year. I had a feeling they would give Colorado a battle there when they're playing that in Manhattan, and they don't give up many points at home. With that sack, third down situation, and 10 yards to go. 4.20 to play in the third quarter. Bounce on the last possession, had a touchdown pass. Terrence Kehoe, look at the throw again. Pocket collapses, gets it off. He's got a man wide open. It's Kehan again. Eddie Sampson finally got there to bump him out of bounds, but Terrence Kehan, who had only 14 receptions this season in the 10 games that have been played thus far, coming up big this time for 33 yards. And Fouts did a great job. Watch him hang in the pocket to the last second. He sees this play unfolding gets that football off just as he gets hit by John Ross number 51 and watch Keehan has right here that little move inside forces the corner James Dye number six to work inside and that's what freed up Keehan so again some terrific execution and that's had just enough time to deliver that football from the 28 yard line play action coach pressure Gets it off and completes it at the 25-yard line to the tight end, Zucker. The blitz was coming that time. The pressure from Brad Martin. Yeah, just a little uh, bootleg-type play, and Brad Martin came in. We, we haven't seen either team run that play very successfully here today. Both uh, defensive coordinators doing a, a good job scouting the opposition and recognizing what their tendencies are. Well, Afala has come back into the backfield now. He's along with Rob Hamilton, who's the up back. Malafala in the deep spot. Here comes the blitz again, but this time the running situation, and Malafala being strung out on the outside. Got maybe a couple of tough yards. Stan Ross and Jamie Cook, linebacking spot, and the safety coming up to do the job on Malafala. We mentioned a few moments ago, to talk about the WAC championship, the implications here, and yeah, oh, my head. <laughs> BYU, yes. you know, if they win today, they that just takes care of business, but they're not winning. They're trailing by 17. And if Utah wins today, it throws up a possibility of what, 14 different fermentations on this scenario. This is Dyson. Dyson breaks loose. Pulled down at the 14-yard line by Stan Ross. A Dyson was in the end zone had it not been for Ross. And a late penalty flag has just been thrown in here. Yeah, I think there's a little tussle downfield. Stan Ross makes a shoestring tackle on Dyson, and Dyson is limping going off the field. If he doesn't get to his ankles, Dyson's in the end zone for another touchdown, and Dyson waves people off and says, I'm going back in there. Kevin Dyson was the guy who made the catch to win the Freedom Bowl for Utah. Personal foul. On the defense, and that's the distance to the goal, ooh. first down. Uh, and that's tacked on after the game. Here's that quick screen that Utah runs so well. Well, see the blocker setting up downfield. Dyson gets some blocks. And there's Ross just barely extending himself to make the tackle. Now, the penalty occurred away from the football. But again, there was some activity downfield. And BYU really hurting themselves now here in the third quarter with penalties. 
Ball is now at the seven-yard line with two and a half to play in this third quarter. Utah trying to build on that 17-point advantage. Ron Johnson cracks inside the five, gets maybe three yards altogether. For the center of the defensive line for the Cougars, pulls him down. A little John going on right now. Chris Ray going at it with Jamie Cook, face to face. You think there's not intensity here? They're 35 miles apart, and they live with one another. And there's family, there's people you work with. I mean, this kind of game Bragging doesn't right. just last a week. This hangs That's on right. for a whole off season and a whole nother season until they play again. Ron McBride is the only coach to take the Utes to more than one bowl game. They've gone to bowls the last three years, and he's trying to extend that string. And certainly, if they can win this game today, that's going to enhance their hopes as they'll go to seven and four on the year. Stout power backfield alignment. Johnson with a handoff, and he gets only a yard at best before he's thrown back to the five-yard line by Lane Hale. Cougars need to create a turnover if they can here. Fouts had a little trouble getting out from under center and stumbled, but he did get the handoff off to Johnson. He talked with the, well, let's take a look at the See replay here. Watch as he comes out, just he gets his foot caught, and it looks like on his left guard, and then stumbles to get out, but he does secure the football on the Johnson's midsection. Johnson came out, and uh, we've got a new running back in there, Rob Hamilton. Johnson may have been injured on that last play. Now a lot of whistles as they... Break out of the huddle. We got a timeout being taken, I believe, by BYU. Timeout, BYU. That's first timeout. So timeout on the field. We're just inside a minute to play in this third quarter. We think the left shoulder may have been injured by Juan Johnson. He's on the sidelines. When we come back, we'll see if the youth can capitalize on this opportunity. They spread everything out now. But Two receivers split to each side. Malfala is the lone power back. Looking to throw. Touchdown. Wow. Lost just inside the goal line. And Utah has taken total command of this ball game. That was a great throw by Fouts by formation and motion. They were able to spread out. The Cougar defense, Lusk was the inside receiver. There were three receivers on that side. He just made a little quick out, and Fouts delivered that football perfectly. Second touchdown pass of the afternoon for Fouts. He hit Keehan earlier. Keehan had a big 33-yard catch to help set up this score, Henry Lusk. And now Fulsifer for the conversion attempt, and he just nails it through the upright. So this is now a 27-3 lead. And let's check in on what's going on with UCLA and USC as we go back to our New York studios and John Saunders. LA, that big lead of 18 points at 21 to 3. John Robinson has not had any success against the Bruins since he took over as head coach back at USC. Yeah, you wonder what's churning around inside that man right there as we look now at a fired up Utah club. Bounce was four for four on that last drive. Here are the numbers, and again, nearly five minutes on the drive. 61 yards and nine players, and Lusk goes the final four on the pass for the touchdown. Yeah, now the Cougars have to throw away their game plan. I mean, they, they have to just get to throw in the football, spread things out, go to a two-minute offense, because they have to make up some much-needed points. Would have never, ever thought, I don't think anybody here, that you would see the Cougars with just three in the final minute of the third quarter. Dye is back about six, seven yards, and he's not going to bring this one out. So Pulsifer really put the leg into it. Well, what's going to happen right now here, Spags? You going to just uh, throw caution to the wind and start launching? Well, I think you, you have to try and execute things underneath offensively. If there's any difference between these two football teams, it's the speed at the wide receiver position. Utah has it. We've seen it today. BYU does not. They've got good possession receivers, but they don't have a breakaway threat on offense, and that's going to hurt them. But they have to just try and drive the football down the field, mix some passes and runs in here, and hope they get a turnover on defense. So occasion with a quick pass over the middle. It is complete to the tight end, Mealy. He gets over the 32-yard line. Should be enough for the first down and the quick hitting pickup. You look there at Jeff Kirkman, the number one tackler for Utah's defense. 
coaching staff for BYU is very concerned about the athletic ability of Utah and their hard-hitting defense, and certainly those fears have been justified thus far. Complete again. This time it's Jason Cooper across the 40 to nearly the 43-yard line, so boom, boom, and he's picked up about 22 yards or so. And the only question here, uh, there's no... Uh, BYU can move the football down the field. It's, it's a question of whether that offensive line can continue to protect their quarterback. Play after play, those defensive linemen will be coming. Then you wind up in a sack situation, and it's hard to convert first downs. But so far, they've done a great job with their first two plays on this drive. Inside handoff. Kamui to the 48-yard line. So they countered and came on the ground that time, starting to mix it up. And still, we're down now to the final seconds of this quarter, the clock running. And in fact, that will probably be, they're going to try to get a playoff here prior to the end of the quarter, but they're going to have to hurry. Nope. No, they missed it by about a half a second, it yep. appears. Whistles being blown. Let's make sure that this is, in fact, the end of the quarter, keeping in mind what happened at the end of the first quarter <laughs> when we had zeros on the scoreboard, but we still had a play coming. Well... We played three here at Pro Bowl, 27-3 in favor of the Utes. We'll return with more action between the Cougars and the Utes after this message and a word from our ABC station. But some do. In fact, most wives would rather have their husbands all to themselves instead of off playing with the boys. But some just wait for those rare moments. To Spectacular mid-November afternoon at the foot of the Wasatch on the campus of BYU. Gary Gerald, John Spagnola, and down on the sidelines, Holly Rowe. Glad to have you with us for this great in-state battle between these rivals, a series that dates all the way back to 1896. And I don't think anybody here expected that we'd go to the fourth quarter with Utah on top by 24 points. BYU with the ball at their own 48-yard line as we get set for the final 15 minutes of this one. The WAC championship postseason bowl bids on the line for both of these clubs. The play action fake. Sarkeesian now flips it out to Hamuli. Hamuli gets into Utah territory, and that'll give us a chance now to check out third quarter numbers through three. Well, again, you possession. see, yeah, oh, absolutely, <laughs> time of possession, and you know that's not always an indicator of a team that's winning. In this case today, it's, it shows the dominance of Utah. Total yards, 364 to 141. You know, passing yardage, BYU still not at 100 yards, and they average over 300 yards a game. So it shows not only how well the offense is playing, but how well the defense is playing for the Utes. Inside handoff, Winfield. Not finding much to work with that time. Got a couple there. Let's maybe see if they put it inside the 40-yard line. Well, looks like the Cougars are going to a hurry-up offense. Here it is, the beginning of the fourth quarter. No huddle. They realize time is of the essence for them. Kanuli. <laughs> Sarkeesian was underneath the guard. Can you believe that? <laughs> Intended out there for Mike Johnston, but nowhere near there. That was amazing because Hamuli alerted Sarkeesian. He might have gone into the count and the ball been snapped and, and there would have been nobody home. And look at Sarkeesian. <laughs> it's poor Steve. It's thinking, did I just do what I thought I just did? And the answer is a resounding yes, and 65,000 people Let's saw it. Let's take a look at this. He's behind Elias uh, Faupula. <laughs> and Hema Hamuli comes out. Hey, whoa, whoa, center's over there. Oh, okay. that's amazing. I think even Capuzzi on defense is trying to help him out. <laughs> that time to throw. Steps up. Arm may have been hit. Completes the pass right over the middle. Elahu pulled it down. And this is the best scoring opportunity on this 19-yard pickup that the Cougars have had. Harold Lusk provides the tackle. You know, we weren't sure if we'd see K.O. Louie today. He has bruised ribs, some cartilage problems. Watch how this ball just gets over 43. Kautai Oliveo, he thought he had a beat on that ball, and he misses it. Great concentration by Keala Louie, and they convert the first down, and you're right, the best drive we've seen today by the Cougars. Ball at the 20-yard line, first down, early fourth quarter. 
going deep. He's got a man. Hamuli has the touchdown catch. And the Cougars igniting this crowd. Now, wait a minute. Was he out of bounds? He was, in fact. He had gone out of bounds and running the route, apparently. And as you indicated earlier, Spags, you can't come back inbounds and make a catch. Either that or his left foot was right on the end zone as he caught the football. Let's see if we can find out in this end zone look. As he's coming down the sidelines, everything is fine there. Watch that left foot. That's right on the line. And the official's right there, and he rules no reception. Touchdown. So back at the 22nd down. Oh, they had a full blitz coming that time, but there was movement in the line prior to the snap of the ball. Oh, what a disappointment, and it just absolutely has stunned this crowd. They were generating the most noise we'd heard thus far today for the Cougars, and it is absolutely quiet in this stadium right now. Ball start on the offense. Five-yard penalty, second down. So now they hurt themselves, and they'll go back to the 25-yard line. That's unfortunate. Here you have a, a seven points uh, taken off the board. And Mooley had just drifted a little bit to the sidelines, and Utah's becoming, or I'm sorry, BYU's becoming undone a little bit. It's their sixth penalty of the day. It seems like every one has been a crucial one. He's out of protection this time, but no receivers open. Sarkeesian trying to fend off people, and finally, in the grasp, he's pulled down. Nate Keo was there. And you can't fault the offensive line there, Gary. I mean, no. that was good protection. That's a covered sack. I mean, he was looking for the open receivers. He thought he had some people downfield. Tried to continue to buy some time in the pocket and probably could have done a little better job escaping within the pocket. Watch how this pocket just gradually collapses so as he's looking up. downfield, looking downfield, and now somebody's got a hand of him and he can't get free. Nate That's Kia. Nate Kia, number 88. Yeah, got a big paw on that jersey. And this this third and 21, and the ball has been moved all the way back now to the 31-yard line. Right over the middle, Hamuli can't make the grab at the 14, so it's going to bring up a fourth down situation, and what a momentum breaker that play and the denial of the touchdown. Yeah, now, now the Cougars have to figure out if they want to punt the football or go for it, and it appears they're going to go for it on fourth down. They have nothing to lose, and it's... It's already at that point in the game for them where uh, they have to try and convert a first down here. Now that's where the reception had it picked up half the yardage would have put them in a little better position here at fourth down. But now they've got fourth down in a mile. Fourth and 21. Out of the shotgun. Looking toward the left corner. Is made at the 10-yard line to complete to the tight end. <laughs> Look at that Neely, spot. Is he going to be there for the first down or not? Boy, is this a game oh. of inches or what? You have Hamuli on the sidelines with his foot just out. Neely with a great catch, but that ball, I believe, is accurately spotted. Just shy of that marker. Look at Kirkman, number 26. He's trying to sell it. No doubt in his mind where this ball goes in. All you got to do is look at the marker there. <laughs> We're still awaiting an official decision. Yeah, keep in mind, it's where the ball is, and he can't roll. He can't do anything. They're going to measure this. Jack Baker says, yeah, let's bring that quick stick in here and figure out. Still, I still want to know how that quick stick works. It's Utah's ball. They put the stick on the other side. How does that work? <laughs> that stick... Doesn't the stick go on the side where the ball is? See, that's why I want to know how it works, because I'm thoroughly confused when it comes to that quick stick. But they've made the decision, and it's Ute's ball. Yes! Julian Mealy is a very good receiving tight end. He runs well after the catch. His soft hands, he puts a terrific move on. That looks like Robert Love, 35 in coverage. And you can see that's where he catches the football, is, and that ball never really makes it past yep. the yard line. The spot is right there. Cougars claiming that they got quick stick on this deal. <laughs> Utah leading 27-3. Just under 13 minutes to go on the ball game. Malafala struggling to get to the 10-yard line. I don't know. I'm having nightmares tonight about that quick stick. I, <laughs> I mean, that thing was... 
on the other. I guess it had yeah. to get to the stick side See, of, the, of the post. That's the trouble there. with you Yale guys. You'll have nightmares oh. about it. I've already dismissed it. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. I'm going to go down on this field afterwards and figure this thing out. Utah doing a terrific job here today. They had the bye week to help them get healthy and get prepared, and they are savoring the moment. We're starting to think about championship opportunities. 64, the last time they won a WAC championship. And the only thing that can derail them right now is if they put that football on the ground. Because they have been nothing short of efficient in their execution offensively and defensively today. Check some other scores and games going on. A lot of traditional rivalries today. Let's check out the Pac-10. UCLA now by 10 over USC. Washington State surprising Washington. Stanford leading Cal by six. Good to see Stanford. If they uh, win that game, they have a chance to go to a bowl. Tyrone Willingham doing a great job there. The first year head coach. Take it over for Bill Walsh. Good play for the Cougars defense now. Third and seven. Just throwing it out here for Dyson, and he can't hang on to it. Well, he got a lot of air under that one as he tried to let the receiver come up with the athletic ability to make the play. That shows you the great athletic ability of Dyson. Let's see if Malfala can block on the blitzes. Oh, he takes... Oh. Ross on, oh, the, my. on the blitz. Ross tries to hurdle. I don't know if you want to hurdle a guy 270 pounds who's that agile. That was a 255-pound linebacker, though, that went sprawling on that deal. Well, I, was, well, I thought we had a uh, earthquake tremor here. I just realized what happened on that replay. Pulsifer standing at the goal line to get the kick off. He angles it away from Dye. Oh, they're they're not, a lot of bounds before it even got to midfield. You know, they're not even taking a chance on Dye, are they? Not at all. So excellent field position for BYU, but the Cougars are still down a bunch. Sunlight, the Wasatch Mountains, the stadium literally at the feet of the Wasatch Range. Just a magnificent afternoon. Temperature around 60 degrees. And Utah doing a number on BYU. The Cougars, however, have the ball. They go to work behind Sarkeesian. On the run, he fires. Incomplete at the 33-yard line. The intended receiver was Typo McGuire. Let's go down to the uh, sidelines. Holly Rowe may be able to shed some light on this bowl scenario. Holly? Standing by with Vince Benstead, the president of the Plymouth Holiday Bowl. And Vince, the preliminary indications look like the WAC champion will go to the Holiday Bowl, not the Cotton Bowl. We think that's probably the case, yes. Cotton Bowl will select on Sunday, so you're kind of in a holding pattern until then? I think that's correct, yes. Tell us what happens now if BYU loses today. Well, if BYU would win and San Diego State would win, then BYU would win the conference. But if they lose, then we could very well have a four-way tie during the next week. This way with the whack, though, it seems to always come down to the last game, right? Yeah, it will be. It could be uh, next week, and then we'll have a tiebreaker, and I'm not sure who's going to win. Okay, thanks very much. Gary? The Alaluhi got down to close to the 10 yard line before he was bumped out of bounds. Let's see, you know, he's actually back out at the 18 yard line as we look again here on the replay. Yeah, Kialaluhi does a nice job coming across the middle, runs well after the catch, too. And again, BYU is right down there knocking on the door. You know, it's important to note in the WAC, though, at least they have a tiebreaker system, yes. unlike the Big East and the ACC, where they allow the Bulls just to pick one team. Here they have a definitive system where a champion will be declared. Got a blitz coming. Look out. Sarkeesian evades the blitz. He throws. He's got a man. He's got a touchdown. Put the McGuire. Well, I'll tell you, Steve Sarkeesian's been hanging in there all day long trying to make plays happen. He hits Kuyper McGuire with an 18-yarder. Harold Lusk was in coverage on Kaipa McGuire. Okay, I'm sorry. Lusk is actually on a blitz. There you see number eight just flash by, and Sarkeesian avoids him and is able to throw across the field, beat Artis Jackson on the touchdown reception. So Sarkeesian. Now here's where I'm wondering with the math. They're down 24 points. Are they going to go for two-point conversions all the way through? As we see Kuyper McGuire, boy, I think banged off his face mask and fell into his arms for the touchdown. And it looks like they're going to go for the conversion. Try to get two. Jackson is the motion man. On the run, the throw is complete. Cooper 
Jason Cooper provides him with the catch, and a two-point conversion makes this a 16-point game with 10.55 to go. So finally, after they were denied and when they thought they had a touchdown in the last series, BYU has now scored a touchdown in 115 consecutive games. They're trying to get back in it, trailing at 27 to 11. The Beers, a diamond is forever. Kellogg's with good taste, nutrition, and value. The best to you each morning from Kellogg's. And Chili's Grill and Bar. Chili's grills like no place else. It's been a long afternoon for Sarkeesian and company, but they finally got it together. It took only 19 seconds to go 48 yards. Capo McGuire with the 18-yard touchdown reception to make this a 27-11 ball game thanks to the two-point conversion. Henry Luss, Keneal Etheridge back, awaiting the kick from Bill Hansen. Hansen drives it halfway into the end zone, and Utah will bring it out to the 20-yard line. Well, a little momentum shift may be in the offing here. Certainly the crowd is back in it. Let's go back to your game stories in this one, Spag. Well, Utah's had a balanced attack today. They've run the football effectively, 147 yards, 219 passing, and the defense has contained Sarkeesian for most of the afternoon. So Utah executing what they needed to do to win this football game on both sides of the football. But, as you mentioned, momentum seems to have changed here. They are up 24 points. They need to get going offensively again in this fourth quarter. Crescendo of noise at Cougar Stadium. Ron Johnson left the game with a shoulder injury as back and gets it out to the 23-yard line. And the key, I think, for Utah is not to go into a shell offensively, to continue to do the things that they have been effective doing throughout the afternoon. Mike Fouts already has a couple of touchdown passes to his credit, somewhat overshadowed by the numbers of Sarkeesian coming into this game. But I've been very impressed with this 5'11", 170-pound junior. Johnson again to the 26-yard line, picks up three, and that's going to give us an opportunity to check in with New York again. John Saunders with a late update on USC and UCLA. Gary, USC playing catch-up once again. Brad Otten, a little play action here. One yard to Tyler Cashman. They went for two. They don't get it, so they trail by four with about three minutes left. Gary. A four-point ball game in Southern California between those arch rivals here in Utah. It is now a 16-point game. Utes with the ball, and you see the clock counting down, time remaining. is complete. Lusk dances across the 40 to the 42-yard line. Henry Lusk with the reception and a big first down. Boy, Henry Lusk was one-on-one -on -one with Eddie Sampson. The free safety and Sampson was giving him an awful lot of room. This is away from the football, the other side of the field, but you see him come in and there was, I mean, Sampson giving him a big cushion. I don't know if he was aware of the down and distance. But all Lusk had to do was turn a field, get past the stick, the quick stick, I should say, and, uh, and convert the first down. There's, Samson never really challenged him on that pass pattern. Nice job that time by the quarterback, also evading some pressure as the weak side linebacker, Brad Martin, is about to get in his face. Completion moves it out to the 41-yard line. Malafala churning. Hi, Chris. He gets to the 45-yard line. Need to update some numbers on him when we can. He had 80 yards rushing in the uh, first half. We'll see if he's been able to get over the 100-yard mark. And boy, am I, is my timing right on here or what? <laughs> With that carry, 102 yards, his third consecutive game over 100 yards. And again, we remind you on Monday night, got a good one, ABC's NFL Monday Night Football. Jerry Rice and the 49ers going to Florida to face Marino and the Dolphins Monday night at 7 Mountain Time here on ABC. Just short of the 45-yard line. Johnson going nowhere this time. That may have 
been thrown a yard or so back. Well, we talked about Utah's game stories from our colleague, Mr. Spagnuolo. Let's check on the BYU side of the ledger. Well, I got a feeling it's not going to be as good. The two sacks given up, but Sarkeesian has been flushed out of the pocket a lot today. And their front has given up 102 yards to Mafala. But Utah, with other backs, Juan Johnson has been able to gain much more than that on the ground today. We saw it was a little over 160 yards so far in this football game. So BYU not executing their game plan. But if they can hold here defensively, it seems like they have momentum on their side right now. Third down and eight. Over the middle, the catch made by Lusk, but only to the 45, 46 yard line, well short of the first down. And Muirfield did a, I mean, Muirbrook did a great job of closing in on Lusk. This time, Lusk was not able to get upfield and get the first down like he was before when he worked on Eddie Sampson. So Muirbrook out of the middle linebacker position closes quickly. And now the Cougars get the ball back. Stay tuned, huh? Let's see what Lock happens. Counting down toward the seven-minute mark as we get ready for Pulsifer's punt. There's Die. Yeah. I still want to see him get his hands on a football. I don't think Pulsifer's going to let him. He's no. kicking out of bounds. I they, mean, they've conceded that today. They sure have. Die coming in with some very flashy return numbers. And we may get a shot this time. No, it's going to get out of bounds again. So, Guy having a hard time getting anything to go today because they just don't kick the ball to him. We've got timeout here on the change of possession. 6.44 remaining. BYU scored in their last possession, their first touchdown of the day. Can they do it again? What did you do today? Well, I pulled up my easy chair and went to the football game at Provo. <laughs> now that's the way to go to the go to a football game. A couple of armchair quarterbacks, aren't they, sitting there on the on the field? They're having a great time. They've got some terrific seats right down there at the thick of the battle. Lavelle Edwards, arms folded, pondering. Clock becoming a factor. 6:44 to go. BYU, occasion ready to look and go long. And this one, oh, that was almost intercepted as Lusk was over there. Harold Lusk got Harold on one side of the ball and Henry on the other. They're trying to go to him. Hey, Mooley again down the sidelines. And Mooley saw the coverage and broke his pattern off. The ball was already in the air. And Lusk, uh, I think Lusk was in position to make that interception if he kept his feet down and made the catch. Now you think about Lavelle Edwards' great success against his arch rival Utah. He's won 19 out of 23 battles, but right now he's facing possibly the third consecutive defeat at the hands of the youth. So occasion trying to do something about it. And a miscommunication there as he tried to go to Galaluhi. Yeah, and they're talking back and forth. I think Sarkeesian expected Kialaluli to break inside, and Kialaluli just hooked up. So this is going to make it third and ten. It's oh, still at the, just across the 20-yard line. That's two plays in a row where the Cougars receivers and quarterback were not on the same page. Kale trying to explain just what happened over there on the sideline. He's talking to Norm Chow, who calls the plays for the Cougars. See if they bring pressure this time or not. Four-man rush. Right over the middle, but the ball just behind Neely, who could not oh, get a penalty marker. Foolish mistake to hit Atula Neely like that after the play. I think it was Kirkman who put the, the hit on him. It wasn't much of a hit, but Neely had pretty much relaxed himself after the play was over, trying to make the one-handed catch. And we'll see if Kirkman, in fact, pops him afterwards. Let's see. Here's Neely trying to make the catch. This play's over. Now watch Kirkman. Boom. Little cheap shot there. Hey, absolutely. That's a personal foul. There's the flag. And Kirkman really hurt his football team right there with that little extracurricular activity. Number one tackler, as we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, and a fellow that the coaches feel has the potential to become a professional football player, but some questionable judgment on that particular hit. New life for BYU. Six and a half minutes to go, trailing 27 to 11, in case you just happen to be joining us today. Confusion oh. being chased out of the pocket. Rowland throws across his body, but no chance to complete that pass as Bloomfield came out of the backfield but unable to get turned around to get a good look at it. 
And, that, and that's one of the things BYU came in game planning today. It's called a dash play. Watch how it's set up. You drop the quarterback up. Watch 15, Imuli Peel, Kafusi 57. That allows the quarterback to get back down. Now here's where Sarkeesian needs to set his feet a little bit and just get that ball in there. And the receiver could help him if he settled down instead of just continuously running. Second down from the 36. This one, but there's no place to go. Trying to shake away, going backwards is Mike Johnston. Well, they had him effectively sealed in that time. Cal Beck was over there. Well, they closed quickly on him, too, didn't they? Sure Looks did. Like Garmin Boglin got in there quickly. And one thing Johnston does so well is, is he runs well after the catch. He's a real deft receiver, and he can make people miss. But right there, everybody held their ground, and Boglin just came in and cleaned them up. Incompleted pass, of course. Stop the clock. 6.13 remaining. BYU faced with third and 11 now. They need to generate something big and they'll do it in a hurry. So Keegan steps up and fires over here. And at the 47-yard line, Gala Louie got a penalty marker down on the far side of the field back at the line of scrimmage. Oh, boy. This is against the defense, so it play will stand. And it will be, I believe, a first down. Offside on the defense. Penalty is refused. First down. Cougars are staying alive. They keep a third down conversion there. Yalaloo, he's got just far enough to make the first down on that reception. And he's having himself quite an afternoon. Yeah, it came in. The 18 balls. Here's the long throw to the sidelines. Hamuli can't quite get there. Just inside the 30-yard line. Stride for stride with Clarence Lawson. And again, deep backfield. Penalty marker down. Well, suddenly every play draws a flag. And I got a feeling that's defensive holding. Here's some of the whack scores today. Miami beating up on Fresno State. That's well, that one's over, isn't it? And the others later starts. Well, now it seems to be that Utah is unraveling just a little bit. We had that critical call against Jeff Kirkman on the bump of the receiver that kept the drive alive, and now they tack on another penalty, moves the ball to the 43-yard line in Utah territory. It was defensive holding. The call came from the field judge. Being a former tight end, the field judge watches the tight end, and I know that if that flag comes out of there and it's holding, it's because somebody held up uh, to the melee. Keegan again out of the shotgun. Again, working against the four-man rush. He's in the grasp, and he's down at the 50-yard line. I think that was Chad Kuha. Got a hand in there. Amoli was also in there. This is a Utah defensive unit that had come up with 19 sacks in the previous 10 games, but let's watch them go to work here. And the concern were the tackles. Watch Kuha, number 45. Yeah, he gets the arm on there, just throws Sarkeesian off balance. That was a concern today by BYU and their coaches. Could their tackles hold up against the onslaught of the ends of the Utes? Trailing 27 to 11. Over the middle, intercepted. It's the fourth time it's happened today. Jason Hooks back into BYU territory. And that one goes a long way toward determining the outcome of this ball game. Jason Hooks, the sophomore from California, coming off a sore shoulder, coming up big here in the fourth quarter. And he's starting today, got the job from Brian Gibson. There you see him, 49. Watch him in his drop. He spies the quarterback now, moves across, and really, there were two Utah defenders that had a chance to make that interception. So did Oliveo, number 43, went through his, his, his hands and right into Jason Hook's hands. And I'll be frank with you, I don't think Sarkeesian saw either one of those players. He was watching his receiver the whole way. So that fourth interception, the most he has ever thrown in one game, has really hurt him. Four turnovers, all four have been on interceptions. So here's the scoreboard and the time remaining. And Utah taking over at the 44-yard line. 
each club. A couple of timeouts remaining now, coming down the stretch. There's that Hawaiian Samoan Tongan connection there. They're <laughs> shouting it up and having a good time. Henry Kafusi, 57. First down for Utah. Hands off to Johnson. Drag down as Brad Martin comes across. We saw some of the connection from the islands for Utah. How about for BYU? Both of these rosters absolutely loaded with broadcasters' nightmares in terms of pronunciations. I'm not even going to attempt. You're not going to go down the list? No, thank you. You're wondering where uh, Tonga happens to be? Well, go to Australia. You turn right, and there you are. And then you start heading east, and you go, and you go, <laughs> and you go some more, <laughs> and then finally, you run into land. Another penalty here that has been declined. The ball at the 43-yard line now. We're at second down and nine. Number 75, Chad Ventriglia. You saw him kind of trying to tuck in his shirt tail there. About 280 plus pounds. Here's the left tackle. Ball's going to the right side of Johnson. Inside the 40, close to the 38-yard line. Well, we've been talking about bowl opportunities and what's at stake. Let's get more as we go down to our sideline reporter once again, Holly Rowe. You know, many many of these big series have a lot of prizes. You've got the brown jug, but BYU and Utah play for something different. It's called the Beehive Boot. This boot was found in the basement of one of the old pioneer homes. It's been around about as long as this series. And uh, whoever is the best in-state team gets it. BYU's had it for the last two, or Utah's had it for the last two years. BYU would like nothing more than to get it back today, but they're running out of time with 4.02 left on the clock. Yeah, and we, and we wanted to see the boot up here at the game today, but Utah said, no, no, we're going to keep it down at our place, make them come down and get it if they <laughs> win the football game. That's so right. They can, things can get a little spiteful in these rivalries, in these interstate rivalries, can't they? Well, it's been interesting in leading up in the hype to this game that they've had to, they had to cover up the various landmarks and different things. The big cougar that's outside the stadium, we mentioned that the Y up on the hillside had been turned red at one time. And uh, the hijinks, no matter how hard you work, it seems like somebody finds a way to circumvent them. There's a great job. There you see the Y up there on the, on the hill. That is a signature landmark here on the foot of the Wasatch. Utah done a great job on those third down conversions. This bounce, the third down. And he's got another first down as he hits the tight end, Tucker. Boy, they have done a terrific job of executing here today. For the most part, they have dominated. They lead 27-11, and we're now inside four minutes to go as Tucker savors the moment, along with some of his colleagues on the sideline. Chad Gahan, number 45. You know, and Fouts has hit five different receivers today with the football. Talking about spreading the football around. Lusk has been a big part of it. Dyson, Tucker, the tight end, of course. Rocky Henry's caught some balls. So he does a nice job. There's his numbers for today, 20 for 30. Pair of touchdown passes. One to Lusk. One to the key hand. Johnson with nowhere to go this time. Thrown for a small loss. Shane Yearbook with the tackle. And now... BYU is going to take its second time out and stop the clock with 3.25 to go. The Utes and their fans savor in the moment. They can sense that a third consecutive victory is at hand. They lead this from 27 to 11 as we take time out. Saturday, Ohio State and Michigan in the Big Ten, and then you've got those Florida rivals, the University and Florida State. Also, at 1.30, we begin coverage of one of the most entertaining events you'll ever run across. Tom Watson, Fred Couples, Corey Pavin, Peter Jacobson, all in the Skins game next Saturday here on ABC Sports. they to make those guys put up the money, though. I'd like to see them do that for a change. You know? I mean, they play for the money, but they're not putting any up. Now we're 
just envious. <laughs> That's right. Billy Johnson, oh, nice run, gets inside the 25, the 24-yard line. He picked up two or three tough ones right at the end of that play. Juan Johnson has been a very fine compliment to the freshman running back, Fala, who already had over 100 yards today. So the third and final timeout, I believe, now being whistled. Yep. BYU takes its final timeout, stopping the clock. But they are down 16, and they've got their backs to that proverbial wall. Yeah, Ron McBride, you know, he'll even his record now against BYU to three and three. He's in his sixth year here. Last year, he got the team ranked in the top 10. I mean, he's done an outstanding job, and he's an interesting character. He really relates well to the players on his team. He's got a lot of quirks, a lot of uh, superstitions. Superstitions. Oh, yeah. He puts hexes on people. He makes his guys walk through mud. He stays Magic in the mud. same hotel room. I mean, <laughs> it goes on and on and on, but uh, here's a guy that uh, it's easy to play for him. He really is a down-home kind of guy, and I, I think the players uh, that he's brought into this organization, the kind of leadership he's shown is has really been a big part for the fact that they've turned this program around. Well, if time permits, stay tuned for the Thrifty Car Rental postgame report featuring scores and highlights from across the country. Big games being played today. As usual, some very interesting results and so much at stake for so many clubs as this business of the bowl gets underway in earnest. Keep in mind, we talked about the Holiday Bowl and uh, BYU controlling their destiny coming in today and the winner of the WAC going to the Holiday, but also there'll be a WAC team that goes to the Copper Bowl and they'll be facing one of the Big 12 clubs. So there are a couple of teams here that are thinking post-season play. And Utah is certainly one of those clubs. On the rollout, Fouts has to slide down as he... I don't know if that was a broken play or a design play. It was a missed handoff. He uh, he did not pivot, reverse pivot quickly enough, and uh, did not get the ball seated into uh, Mafala's stomach, so he had to just take the football himself. Well, that brings up a fourth and seven. The ball is at the 27-yard line, so I'm wondering if we'll see Pulsifer come in for a field goal attempt here, or just what they'll do. I don't see Pulsifer on the field at the moment. I would think not. I would think they wouldn't want to risk getting it blocked and uh, getting a touchdown against them. You're absolutely right. That whistles here as they tried to hustle, and I think this will probably be delay of game. And penalty flags, yeah. Dead ball. Dead ball. Delay of game. Delay of game. On the offense. On the offense. Let's see if they just, I guess they'll just run the football one more time and need some more time off the clock. Up 16 points. That's uh, two touchdowns and two two-point conversions. The likelihood of that occurring is uh, pretty remote. Also for today with a couple of field goals. Hit one from 29, one from 27, but he stays on the sidelines. He's probably hoping for an opportunity because the next one he kicks, if he got one today, would uh, tie him to a school record total of 18 in the season. But right now with a fourth down, he each stay. And they're going deep. Here's Dyson. Out of bounds at the two-yard line. How about that for fourth down drama when you're trying to protect a 16-point lead? And I'll tell you one thing. This is something everybody's going to remember next year coming into this football game. You throw four on fourth down. You're up 16 points. And you do something like that, that is not going to sit too well with the uh, Cougar fans or alums, for that matter. That's nice drop back. He's been doing this all day. Dyson working on Tim McTire. And I don't think he expected that football to be thrown downfield. It's the he first time he's been out of position all day. Kevin Dyson was uh, two steps away from getting his seventh touchdown of the year. The ball actually one step away. They put it on the one yard line. 2.24 to go. Rich trying to get a little frosted on the kick. Inside handoff, and Henry Lust not finding anything going there. Don't know if he was able to dent the line even for a fractional game. Well, rivalries feed off of things like this, don't they? That's right. <laughs> I don't think Lavelle Edwards is. Very pleased with that last play selection by Utah. The Beehive boot is about to go back to Salt Lake City. I wonder what size that boot is. Look at look at down here. Look at the coach McBride. He is he enjoying this moment? Oh, he certainly my, is. Is he ever? 56 years old. You talked about his superstitions. 
right hand. All kinds of movement here before the ball was snapped and whole right side of the line was diving forward. You know, his wife says, I was reading a story about how some of those superstitions got going. I guess he's always been the kind of a quirky guy that way, but back in the 60s when he was a high school coach, he was wearing a pair of pants and he had, the, had a hole in the seat. On the offense, five-yard penalty, second down. Team kept winning. They went on and won a championship, and so from that point on, I mean, just keep the superstitions, and I mean, there are countless numbers of superstitions that McBride has. Yep, and a real balanced day for that Utah football team. 439 total yards of offense. They average 416 this year. Six and one when they get 400 plus yards of total offense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. With those numbers you can usually chalk up a W. They waited and waited, and then from the side, and they go along, the official running in with arms outstretched. Malabala, who opened the scoring today with a 32-yard burst up the middle, this time just churning straight ahead. 274 pounds for his second score of the day. And we should mention, for any youth fan who's tuned in late, he had his jersey torn earlier today, so he's wearing number 14. Oh, look at that. But he bowled in from, what, six yards out, and that's his... The last New jersey number, so uh, the last three were the toughest. Looked like they had him stopped at the three-yard line. But uh, that's a mouthful to say. Chris Matu Mafalo and an armful to tackle. What a great player he's going to be. Pulsifer's conversion is good. Well, it's the third straight year that Utah has scored 34 points against BYU. They're getting used to it. They're liking it. They're on top, 34-11, and we're down to just a... <laughs> ...on 24 carries. Pretty good day's work. Two touchdowns. Yes, it is. Nine plays, 44 yards, 356. And how Fourth about the down. play that set it up, <laughs> that pass to Dyson? No foul in the defense. Player has been ejected. Now the frustration level just kind of peaked out for... Somebody there on the defensive unit for BYU. Hey, Jack Baker's uh, voice got a little stronger, though, didn't it? I thought he maybe he gargled at halftime or did something. We were worried about him. What's the what's the champ there? Give give Ma follow the ball. Isn't that what they cry out here at Baker's Salt Lake City? Fourth quarter kind of guy. You saw the sign up there. The, there's the full name there. Eight syllables. Fuamatu <laughs> Ma'afa'ala. Trying to get used to that when you haven't been used to these teams has been a major challenge this week, but... It's nice to see young folks being able to enjoy and savor moments such as this. And the coaching staff, all of their hard work being rewarded. And of course, on the opposite side of the field, there'll be some long faces. In what has been a stellar season for BYU coming in, having won six of their last seven, and about to be tarnished just a bit. Yeah. And Ron McBride, you know, he, he uses mud. How about the muddy through this whole bowl picture now in the whack? I mean, uh, it's what, 14 it's different get... permutations we talked about? and Now it gets uh, Thanks wild a lot, and Ron. wacky. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, I don't care about the bowl permutation. All I know is if we win this football game, we get a piece of the title, and that's the most important thing. 64, Utah was involved in a three-way tie with New Mexico and Arizona at that time for the championship. Their last outright title was 19. 57. And thanks to Carolyn McMahon with the stats in the booth today and Malibu Kelly Hayes for doing a terrific job helping us out with his spotting. Now Michaels graciously allowed him to slip away and he'll be headed for Miami on the Monday night game on ABC, 49ers and the Dolphins. We do appreciate the efforts of all of our people uh, in the trucks and on the sidelines and manning the cameras and crews and uh, this has been a what a fun afternoon. BYU will put it in play for perhaps a final time with just over a minute to go in this. When you see the numbers on Steve Sarkeesian, the four interceptions, something that he's going to be having nightmares about more than likely. Quality young man, however, we're going to hear a lot from him before his football career is over. Fires, Keala Luhi at the 35-yard line. 
should mention too that Sarkeesian after last week's win came out and guaranteed a victory this week. That's something that uh, I'm sure those uh, Utah defensive players are reminding him about during the course of this <laughs> afternoon. Yeah, I imagine that's been mentioned once or twice. They wind the clock. We come down to the one minute mark. This one complete to Johnston. He's out of bounds to stop the clock. Gets it out to the 43 yard line. Now, assuming, of course, and I think it's safe to say with 59 seconds to go that uh, this one is pretty much in the bag for Utah. Well, you're really going out on the limb. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's the way they stack up. Six and two. Utah moves to the head of the heap. But look at that five and two traffic jam. BYU, Air Force, Colorado State, and San Diego State hanging in there as well with only two losses. So San Diego State playing Hawaii tonight. Second down over the middle right through the hands of... Atawaya out of the backfield. And BYU still plays Fresno State, too, we should mention. And uh, I guess as it worked out for one of the things we've been able to figure out, if Utah does uh, wind up in a four-way tie, they lose out. But if there's a three-way tie, uh, they wind up uh, winning the championship. So events still have to unfold here in the WAC. There's Mike Fouts. His number's on the day. Pretty stout percentage. He's hit better than two-thirds of his passes. He came in at 54% on the year. And a lot of emotion being displayed right there. And you know what? His second half numbers, listen to this, 11 of 13, 155 wow. yards, two touchdowns. Wow. He was flawless in the second half. Absolutely. Up 13 to 3 at halftime. Utah really turned it up in the second now half the and played flawless football. I think his Uncle Dan would be pretty happy about that. I think so, that. yeah. I hope so. Fourth down from the 43. They get the first down. Adewaya gets to midfield. But the clock at 47 seconds. Glad you mentioned the fact that uh, BYU still has the one remaining game against Fresno State. Uh, this concludes the season, the regular season for Utah. Now they'll just have to wait and see what happens in the other remaining games and see if they'll get a bowl invitation. You know, and I think the bye week really helped them. It helped Penn State today in their preparation against Michigan. I think it helped uh, Utah here. They were able to freshen up. They played 10 games in 10 weeks. Pretty tough stretch there. They got a week off. You get to work on the fundamentals. You get to understand what a team's doing. You spend extra time preparing. That gives you an advantage at this point in the season. You get to get a little healthy, too, and get to clean up some of those nicks and bumps and bruises that you pick up along the way. Ball at the 30 after the completed pass to McGuire. 37 seconds remaining. Sarkeesian and in and out of the hands of Johnston. Let's check the scoreboard once again. Some top 25 scores coming your way. McBride continuing to savor the moment on the sideline. Is that, that looked like Earl Hirschheiser there for a second. <laughs> Say, wait a minute. I just engaged the baseball brain. I'm not sure that that was the case. Ooh, look at this. USC lost to that game in UCLA. Yeah. Even though they're going uh, to the Rose Bowl, they already had a tie for the Pac-10. USC with another loss. And I don't think John Robinson, he's 0-5 now against UCLA in his second time round at USC. Well, he'd be muttering to himself tonight, to say the least. Inside the 20 is Ottawa. Added down to about the 18. Clock at 24 seconds to go. You see that... Ohio State, Florida, Tennessee, Northwestern, Florida State. Uh, one, Kansas State is losing, however, to Colorado. The throw for the end zone. Touchdown, Hamuli. Kind of ironic. It seems like that's a play they were trying to make go this whole fourth quarter, and finally they're able to get the touchdown, 18-yarder to Hamuli. But... Uh, they tried him down the left sideline. Remember, he caught the ball. He was just out of bounds. They tried him down the right sideline, and he was isolated on Clarence Lawson, the cornerback, and he made a good play on it. Finally, Amuli makes the touchdown reception, but too little, too late. You can't wonder but help, John, if that one that was denied when he came from out of bounds had an apparent touchdown. It was early enough in the second half that it might have helped the momentum shift, but then when they could not score in that series and ended up having to give up the football, it may have had a profound impact on this game. 
34-17. They will go for the two-point conversion as Tarkeesian rolls out. Got pressure from behind and in front, and he overthrows Johnston, his intended receiver. So 13 seconds to go in this one. And again, we go back to the scoreboard. Lavelle Edwards is going to be wondering what went wrong here. His third consecutive loss to Utah. But I'm pleased to see he got the contract extension. You know, he's uh, a coach that wants to stick around. He's 65 years old and wants to stick around here. And you, and you have to be able to let people know who are recruiting against you right. that they can't use that against you. So the contract extension is in place. And isn't it interesting that, you know, he's one of the winningest active coaches in college football. And uh, same thing is happening with Bobby Bowden this week. Uh, and I put those two on the same level in terms of their abilities as coaches. And Joe Paterno did the same thing as we look at the Penn State score. He said, hey, I want to stick around a little bit longer, too. Uh, so three of the senior coaches in college football getting extended and all want to stay in their in their present roles as head coaches. Continuing to run through scores, Kansas beat Oklahoma State. It was Oregon State with an early touchdown over Oregon. That's a bit of a surprise in the first quarter. Holding up ending Alabama. And the rumors that Gene Stallings may step down when this year is over. Starting to fly around Tuscaloosa. The Apple Cup. You think when they play for a boot here, they play for an apple there. Right. Nice scoring game. 63 points in that Washington Washington yeah, State matchup. They play for what the Paul Bunyan Trophy in Michigan, Michigan State. Look at these young people. Robert Love, we saw their number 35. They're just having a great time on the sidelines as they savor this one. 13 seconds of playing time, and it will be official. Utah for the third consecutive year, hitting that magic 34 point total against a BYU squad that had averaged better than 27 points a game at one six of their last seven. Today held to 17, and of course, six of those 17 coming just moments ago. You know, that's the first time Lavelle Edwards has ever lost to the same team three consecutive years, too, in his 24-year history here. Well, this should be interesting here. Let's watch now. Onside kick attempt. It's a big bounce. Got the nope. cross and no problem. Johnson picks it up. No, it's Lusk. Harold Lusk. Harold trying to. He's going to run out the clock here and get on his own. He couldn't quite. Let me give you a little tip here, Harold. On an onside kick, you ought to just take the football and kneel down. Bill Hanson, the kicker, who was number four there, was trying out there trying to get his guys out of there. That's the last thing you want is something ugly to finish the game here today. Lusk, of course, uh, you know, wanted to make a big play out of it, but I think he's better off just taking a football and taking a knee. One more play, and this game's over. Well, it's been physical, as we expected. It was slow starting in terms of scoring, which we did not expect. But Utah, who came in as a touchdown underdog, now six seconds away from wrapping this one up. Personal foul on the offense. Dead ball, personal foul on the defense. Penalties offset. New quarterback Brandon Jones in. He's the guy who started the first two games this year for Utah. Finishing up, Mike Fouts took over for him in the third game of the year. And Jones, to his credit, handled that very well. He had waited to play as a quarterback. And We've got, time got his for opportunity this year. One, maybe two at best opportunities right here. Now they're not even going to fool around with this situation. That's going to be it. At Cougar Stadium in Provo, Utah, the Utes from the University of Utah have put a severe crimp in BYU's plans with a 34-17 victory. Back in a moment.